powered from the Perdomo Cigar Studios on the Black Stage in Indian Trail, North Carolina, and broadcasting from the Drew Estate Studio in California. It's episode 163 of the Primetime Show. Tonight, we welcome back Steve Saka of Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust. And as always, the Primetime Show is sponsored by Saga Cigars. Davos Reyes introduces another chapter of the saga, the Saga Celez. Celez is a Spanish word that means leisure after work. In the spirit of the standing idea of owning your own journey and making your own saga, Saga Celez is the perfect companion to enrich those moments of choice, making them truly yours. The Saga Celez carries a blend of Criollo, Olor, and Peloto Cubano wrapped in a selected Ecuador Shade Claro wrapper that generously delivers with elegance a surprisingly rich and balanced smoke. It's available in three sizes and affordable price. Ask your retailer for Saga Celez. And by Perdomo Cigars, Awarded Nicaraguan Cigar of the Year in 2014 by Cigar Journal, the Perdomo 20th Anniversary brand has consistently earned the highest scores in the industry and is a top seller in humidors around the world. The Perdomo 20th Anniversary blend requires tobaccos that have been carefully hand-selected and are well-aged for a minimum of eight years. The Perdomo 20th Anniversary is offered in three distinct wrappers, a smooth, creamy Ecuadorian Connecticut, a rich, earthy Cuban seed Nicaraguan sun-grown, and a dark, oily Cuban seed Nicaraguan Maduro. Combining these beautifully bourbon barrel-aged wrappers with thick, high-priming binder and filling tobaccos gives each blend a balanced complexity with layers of rich flavors and smooth, elegant aromas. Perdomo Cigars is a family-owned and operated company headquartered in Miami, Florida, manufacturing and agricultural facilities in Esteli, Nicaragua. Perdomo's highly acclaimed cigar brands include the Perdomo Estate Selection Vintage, Perdomo Double Age 12 Year Vintage, the Perdomo 20th Anniversary, Perdomo Reserve 10th Anniversary Champagne, Perdomo Habano Bourbon Barrel Age, Perdomo Lot 23, and many more. For great tasting notes and pairing information, check out the new Perdomo website at www.perdomocigars.com. And by Miami Cigar and Company. Nestor Miranda said it best. There's a mystery in death to Africa that captivates my spirit. Always drawing me to come back. This cigar, Don Lino Africa, captures the way going there makes me feel. Cigar form making is an art form, but in the moment when the cigar becomes art itself, you have something special. Don Lino Africa returns from Miami Cigar and Company. The brand you remember blended even more masterfully this time in partnership with tobacco era A.J. Fernandez. It's an exotic complex blend meant to mesmerize. Available in five box press patolas. Don Lino Africa returns. Ask for it at your local retailer. And by Drew Estate, check out and download the Drew Estate app, app for your mobile device. Keep up with everything going on Drew Estate. Experience the subculture that is the Rebirth of Cigars. Available on iTunes and Google Play. For more information, check out www.drewdiplomat.com. And as always, all the live streaming for the Primetime Network of Shows is sponsored by Drew Estate, as well as the California Studios for the Primetime Show. Welcome, everybody. This is Primetime Episode 163. Today is Thursday, November 5th. 2020. This is Will Cooper. I am on the black stage here in the Perdomo Cigar Studios, joined cross country by my friend and colleague in the Drew Estate Studios on the Year to Rat stage, Mr. Aaron Loomis. How are you doing tonight, Will? I'm doing really well. I'm doing really well. So how about you? I'm doing well as good as well. It's it's uh I don't know. It's a, it seems like uh, it's a little bit of uh Pressure let off everybody. I mean, most people, uh, other than the ones that can't, uh, you know, let go of things. But uh, yeah. otherwise, I think it's a, a good time. Yeah. It, did you see that Dojo was trying to bait me into something today? And I, I, yeah. I kind of, yeah. I kind of swung the bait a different way with him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because, like, because, because again, you're there's not there's media and there's cigar media, and they're, and they're and they're different. Like everyone, they, mm. you're, because you're cigar media, you're not media, as I was, I was, uh, everyone tells me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so no uh yeah i'm just like you know bear and i did the show on tuesday and i gotta mm -hmm. say you know the audience was fantastic we didn't have any and i was let me tell you i was really worried i almost wanted to pull the plug on it right beforehand mm -hmm. right and bear convinced me hey we've been planning this for two years i said okay we told people we're gonna do it we did it um and it went i think it went really well um nice. i didn't get one complaint about political bias um, we didn't have to censor anybody of, of the 700. We got about we got about exactly 700 comments. I saw there was not one that required censorship or even it was a couple people with a couple of opinions. That's OK. It just didn't get nasty or anything. That's what we didn't want to have. So. So no, no cigar smokers were watching then you're saying most cigar smokers were watching yesterday. And uh, <laughs> I think I think Skip did peek in there for a little while. I don't think Jeff did. So I, 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 but I'm not 100 percent sure if they stayed for a while. If they if either one of them were in there. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, well, like I said, it was good. I can't complain about that. Um, and, uh, you know, it is what it is right now here. So, mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, you know, we're in one of the, we're in one of the interesting States right now. So, um, oh, yeah. and, 
and you know, I can't. It's just like I said, it's interesting coming from another part of the country where I grew up. The politics here are very different. So, yeah. and it's almost like night and day in a lot of ways. So it's interesting. And and and, and it's there's parts of the state you can go to, and it's one way, and parts of the states another way. So, yeah, yeah. So it works in a lot of states, I think. It, it yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think your state slants very one way is what I'm kind of getting at. Uh, well, depends where you population live. Population right? wise, yeah, but it's, it's 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 pretty much like uh large metropolitan areas are all one way, and then the rest of the state is another way. Right. But there's more. There's a lot more people in those areas, so it makes it look like it leans that way. So. Well, what's funny is I, I yeah I know a lot of people from those areas and. I wouldn't know if what they're I, if you if there's so many people I know from those areas, I don't really know which way they lean politically. Um, so right. it, it, it's I mean you and I that's really a good don't that's a good way to know them. <laughs> yeah, I mean I mean in general I've always taken the approach that we leave politics at the door and uh, yeah unless I know I can just have a little fun behind the scenes, but that you know again we keep it off social media so right yeah um so I think without further ado let's bring on our special guest tonight uh. He's been on the primetime show several times, but we haven't had him on, uh, you know, a full segment here in a long time. Go, it's, yeah. it's, so it's all, a couple of years. Um, welcoming him back to the primetime show, he is the one and only Steve Saka of Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust. Steve, welcome back to primetime. So why do you think I haven't been on a couple of years? I think that's what media bias, right? What else could it be? <laughs> that's right you're right <laughs> well steve that's like you am i not a, am i not a paid sponsor or did i not pay you this year no you paid me i can't remember you paid me no all it, right it, so i can make a request hold on hold on so you're gonna read my ad during the program yes you want me to, i could read i can read, i had i had a tee up for that so you, your ad will be read <laughs> okay well yeah. how about this can we just not do my ad during the program because I, I listened like 45 minutes before the show started. I, I've had enough ads for me. So we just skipped <laughs> the Dunbarton Tobacco Trust. Okay, it's a we, freebie this week. Thank you, Steve. We really Thank you, Steve. Our audience really – this episode is brought to you by so, – Okay, Steve, this is like perfect – this is a perfect segue because here's what we're doing. We've never done this before tonight. You're going to get the opportunity to complain, put, complain about Aaron and I however you want to open up this show. This is this is this is open season. We're giving you it. I'm in a I'm in a I'm in a good I'm in a good lighthearted <laughs> happy fucking mood. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm in a good happy tricky licky mood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's tricky a licky, you know, that tricky licky. That could be a a, a line extension yeah. of the tricky time. Never said yeah. that in my life before now, but it does sound like something that I'd pay a prostitute at least an extra hundred. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> Uh, so nothing, Steve. I mean, no, no complaints to us. I mean, usually every media show I've seen. No, Steve, man. Has, I got to say, year, there's, this year's got so much serious shit going on. Who's got time to figure out what the fuck you knuckleheads are doing? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> oh my goodness. I got, I got my own problems. Trust me. I'm, yeah. I, I'm needy. I'm needy. I'm needy. So yeah. No, I really. Uh, is it really been that long since I've been? I know it's been a while, but I mean, I've been on so many podcasts this year that they all just kind of run into one another. So I, I didn't even realize it had been that long. Yeah, the I last think you've been on some panel shows and like the right. virtual trade show stuff, but like having you as the the only guest, it's been. A, have, I think it's been a while. Yeah. And uh, your, right. the last full show was episode fifty one, and then your last panel show was the virtual trade show back in July, which was a shorter appearance. Right, which, which was a great okay. appearance. So yeah, yeah that's, so, that is a that's a long ass time. Well, and what I happened think, to, with the pandemic? You were everywhere for a while, and we were actually trying to navigate around the people who were doing a lot of shows on purpose. Right. So again, because once you're on a whole bunch of the shows, you start competing with the other shows head to head. So I knew Bear had. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know what to say either. You run out of shtick. I mean, there's yeah. only so many times you can, I mean, I try really hard when I'm on these podcasts to at least get something in there that, you know, makes there a reason why the audience would want to even listen to it. But I mean, that stretch there between like what, April and, oh, I guess the uh, end of September, yeah. it was insane. Yeah. 
I mean, it was like, I was literally, there were, there were times I was like booked on three a week. Mm-hmm. No, it was. And that's and why. You, and, you, yeah. and you can even remember what you said on the last one. Makes it really hard to keep your lies in check. And there's <laughs> yeah. that much video of you. Yep. It's like, wait a minute. What, what, what did I say? <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. So yeah, I, I, no, I, you know how I am about these things. If I, if I wanted to be on, I, and I thought it was really, well, let me say it differently. I could have asked and I didn't ask. And had I asked, I'm sure you guys would have accommodated me somewhere. You're always welcome. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you know, it's the same thing with the dojo guys. I haven't been on their program in a long time, you know, but it, I don't feel as though I don't get dojo love, you know, because yeah. of it. it's just, uh, look, I'm, I'm busy. They're busy. I know there's a lot of people that love that do these. And I have a lot more opportunities to be on a lot of shows. And for some people, you know, this is, uh, they don't have as much opportunity as I do. So, yeah, you know, but I always welcome it. I, I like it. I enjoy it. Yeah, no, we get it. I mean, I know. And then it was around August. We had just done a virtual show. Bear had you on his show. And, you know, even though Bear's show is separate, we try not to compete the two shows and we, we right. make sure we navigate the get. And so we don't want to have the same guest on the same month usually. So, that's kind of how this all navigated it, it, it's not and like I said, there were a lot of people you in your boat who said how come you haven't asked me to be on the show i said because you're doing like 10 other shows this, this month i mean so <laughs> yeah. we kind of we aaron and i started going out of the box and we just started inviting people that we hadn't invited and with the, with the pandemic people were saying yes because they had the time right yeah plus too you know it's good get some people get some new voices yeah i mean fresh we're, we're, being said now, whether it was really fresh or not, I don't know because I don't, I don't, I don't, the only time I ever listen to any of these programs is if I'm in my truck driving is where I hear most of them. And I haven't been doing much of that year either. Yeah. So I'm not only has there been a plethora of these shows and podcasts, but I've actually listened to less this over this year because I haven't had that time in the truck. Yep. You know, because that is how I, that's how I hear most of them. I just stream them in the truck or I download them onto my phone and, you know, play them when I'm in the truck going somewhere. That's a lot of how I did it too. So I'm actually like, I have this, I usually listen to a rotation of podcasts and I'm behind on most of them for that same reason. Cause typically I don't listen at home with, with them. It's in, it's in the car is the way I'll do it. Yeah. Well, it's hard to listen at home because it's not like I get to stop and just listen. I'm, you know, typing, I'm answering emails. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. So even when I like, like when people post video reviews, somebody might post a 15 minute review. And many times it takes me an hour and a half to get through the 15 minutes. Cause I'm just constantly pausing it. You know what I mean? So, yeah. So the, the car, the car is a way more convenient way to, for me to digest it. Oh, I agree. And what, and what am I sacrificing? Looking at your two ugly mugs. Right. I don't mind missing the video <laughs> feed. So yeah. It's actually a more pleasurable experience for the most part. <laughs> very good, very good. No, uh, so this obviously, I mean, you've been you've been in New Hampshire most of the year, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's been absurd. It's uh, it's, it's just it's just driving me batshit crazy. I'm actually leaving tomorrow to go someplace. Oh wow! It's the first time since March, um, and. Uh, I'm not telling anyone where I'm going because if I tell them that I'm going to a certain place, I'm going to have a million other people wish I was going. Right. Not, not wish, but they're going to say, why don't you stop and see me? Yeah. And it's just mm. not possible. This is uh, I mean, I will be visiting one store. Um, I might pop in a few on my way of where I'm going to and from, but I, I don't want, there's no schedule. It's not an event. It's for, it's for meetings and business and all of that. So I have to go to a certain place. This is going to be my first real, like, real go anywhere since pretty much tail end of March, I guess. That's about the end of it. The last time I went anywhere. Wow. Did uh, did you go? Have you been to Central America this year at all? I was last time I was in Central America was the end of February. Okay, that's when I was. That's probably right around when I was there. The last week of February, and and in fact, right now, um, you know, the airport's still closed. And for, well, it's not actually closed, but it's really difficult still because of the way the government is treating. You have to have a COVID test, no problem, but it's only allowed to be 72 hours old. 
tough, but you can do it. The problem is not tough COVID testing with results. The problem is getting certified PCR that you can present. It's getting, you know, the paperwork. But there are places that do that, um, that you can get if you're willing to pay. Uh, the dilemma is that Nicaragua needs you to mail them those or forward them to them 36 hours before your flight lands. So they can't be older than 72 hours when you land and they have to have them 36 hours in advance. So essentially you have a 36 hour window to take the test, get the results, get the proper paperwork, get it to the government, book it through the airline. And then a lot of the airline flights, the only airline that's been really flying with some sort of frequency out of Miami has been Avianca. And Avianca has pretty much canceled about two thirds of the flights. So every time you schedule a flight with them, it's a two out of three shot that it's even going to go. Because what ends up happening is people can't get their results quick enough with the paperwork to hit that 36 hour window for them to actually get on the plane. So it's proven really problematic to travel to, to NECA. Uh, I know a few people in my business have uh, chartered planes um, last month. I know, I believe Abdel did that. I believe the Padrones did that. I believe the Garcias did that. Um, I don't make that type of money. Uh, so, but I have to be honest with you, I'm seriously looking into it now. One yeah. way or the other, I will be in Nika by January. I just don't have a choice. Right. So, uh, and if that means I have to spend $40,000 to charter a private plane out of Miami, then that's just what I'm going to have to do. Um, I think there's a better solution. Um, they've opened the border in Tegucigalpa as long as you have the paperwork. So between Honduras and Nicaragua. So I could fly to Tegucigalpa. I could get a COVID test there, wait until I get the results with the paperwork, who knows how long that'll take, three days, five days, a week. And then once I get that, then drive from Tegucigalpa to Esteli and cross the border. Um, and then, but what I'm a little fuzzy on is nobody has given me clear directions as to, do I need to have another certified COVID test to cross back out of Nicaragua into Honduras <laughs> uh, by a vehicle. Right. I've gotten very conflicting answers on that. And I'm waiting. I, I actually uh, reached out to Nestor because Nestor crosses the border with more frequency than anybody else on the planet. Um, and uh, I'm waiting to see what he tells me because he's probably one of the few people that I would actually trust because I know everybody else is telling me what they think or what they've heard. I know in his case, he does it. So, mm -hmm. you know, but it may get a little confusing because I'm not sure. And this is a question I had for him is he may have dual citizenship. Mm -hmm. And obviously if you have dual citizenship, well, then the rules change. Yeah. You know? I've done the border cross twice. Um, and it was like a several hour yeah, process. No, no, this is a several hour process. This is five years ago. And it was a several okay, hour process. Of the yeah. I crossed the border a ton of times. So it's not a straightforward process. Border. Yeah. yeah. I don't think it's a big deal. I mean, like I said, I've done it at least 30, 40 times. So I don't think that's the problem. Right. I'm okay with that part. It's, it's just the test and the paperwork and all the rigmarole. Yeah. And then the other thing too, you guys know how piss poor my Spanish is. I got to get a certified COVID test in Gusagapa. Uh, it's literally going to be, it's going to be a shit show. But if that's what it comes to, that's what it comes to. One yeah. way or the other, I'm either going to die crossing from Honduras to Nica in January or I'm going to be on a private plane that's going to go down in flames in the Gulf of Mexico in January. But one way or the other, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to. I can't uh, right. I can't do it. I can't I can't wait. And I would go now, but oddly enough, I scheduled a whole bunch of other stuff um, because I, like I said, just just the way this year's co this year's been a really strange year. Oh, I bet. And incre incredibly busy for a year that we really shouldn't be busy at all. Right. True. Now, Steve, you, you mentioned Honduras and Nicaragua. Do you have any reports on the hurricane? I've, I got some video from Justo in Honduras, and, and Honduras looked like it, it took a big brunt. I know, I know Jalapa got hit. Have you heard anything about your factories as, as everything operates? Yeah, okay? actually, relatively a, a non event. It turned out to be a heavy rain event, um, but heavy rain is kind of par for the course. It kind of slowed down production this week because when it gets that wet, it becomes very hard to deal with. Um, it interrupted all the transportation 
um, in and out of the country this week. So items that were slated to be shipped out on Monday, Tuesday, um, they've been delayed. We're going to try to get them out on a flight on Saturday right now. But for all practical purposes, it was pretty much a rain only event for Esteli. Um, the wind was not just because of the way the storm ducked in and then yeah. cut almost due north right away back up into Honduras. Um, Esteli was spared the brunt of it, which is good because, I mean, Nicaragua, Nicaragua and hurricanes don't mix. It's not a it's not a good scenario. Well, you you weren't down there with Hurricane Mitch, right? That's the big one everyone talks mm-hmm. about. Right. I wasn't physically down there at the time, but was I going to and from during the period? Yes. Okay. Did I see? Did I see some of the aftermath? Yes. Yeah. And that that was a pretty destructive one, from what I've heard about it. A big problem with that was mudslides. Yeah. The mudslides were real. That was where the the bigger there was more am- damage, I think, done by the the resulting mudslides than there was actually from the the winds of the hurricane. Let's just be blunt about this. Uh, none of the third world is built for hurricanes. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I mean, most of the people are living in what essentially is a shanty, okay, by any stretch of the imagination. So, I mean, it's always much more devastating for them than any place in the United States. Right. Um, but uh, but the, I think the biggest problem with Mitch was, was more the mudslides. Right. And uh, just infrastructure, power and water for the few places that had water and road damage. It was it was it was a big setback for Hurricane Mitch. Um, you know, I saw like I think I saw a video from Nick Perdomo, his lava farm. He had sandbags. He, he ended up walling around that. Anything with the farms down there? Have you heard anything? Are, are the farms OK down there? Do you know? Um, I talked to a couple farmers um, and for the most part, what they're telling me is that uh, Look, at this point, it's almost all seedlings and tunnels. And because it was primarily a rain event, not a wind event, they didn't suffer. Um, for some of the smaller farmers that still do their seedlings um, ex- exposed, um, it's, they're going to have to start over. Yeah. Because it was just too much water. Um, but I think that, look, we're at the front end of this. So I think that... Uh, we're at the front end of the planting season is what I meant to say. Okay. So I don't think that there's anything that's a major setback. Okay. Now, again, had the hurricane, I don't know about Jalapa. I haven't gotten detailed reports about, you know, because when there was definitely more damage wind wise, or there was more wind in Jalapa. So, I mean, obviously there's going to be a question about barns. Barns are always, again, barns aren't exactly built to, uh, to yeah. standard spec here, you know what I mean? No, so. not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely but, not that a brick, brick and stone there. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I mean, if I remember right, Hurricane Mitch, I think like eleven thousand people died in that storm. Yeah, because it was was that was nineteen ninety eight, if I remember right. It sounds, it's been a long time. Ninety eight? Is that true? Ninety eight. That's what. Yeah. 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 It was like it was like September or October of ninety eight. October. It was October. Yeah. I see one of our chat people, Chris, is putting up the forecast. It's heading towards Florida and it's heading towards North Carolina because every hurricane that hits North America heads the rain. We get the rains. We get the remnants of these rains every time. So uh, they're already forecasting four to five inches of rain here in Charlotte from this thing next week. So, uh, so I mean, has it picked up speed? Because that was part of the issue was just how slow it moved. Yeah, that, they're saying it's going to pick up speed when it hits the Gulf. Okay. Yeah, and if John McTavish is listening, he's our weatherman um, for the Cigar Media. He, I think he'd have a better idea. He, he's tracking the storm as we speak. So, <laughs> I think <laughs> that guy is like the ultimate weather guy. <laughs> so, uh, I, I see the chat right now. I'm looking over at it. Chris Duque put up the uh, the track. So. The track. It's and, and like I said, that track's going. It will find its way. This will find its way to North Carolina. I'm telling you. Well, they said it already. I said when this thing was moving west into Nicaragua, it was going to hit North Carolina, and and I didn't know it really was. But we're not going to get. I mean, we're not going to get. We'll get a lot of rain, and we don't deal with rain well here because of creeks. So um, you know, but we're not going to have catastrophic damage like like obviously down in Central America. 
Uh, so I hope I hope every I'm glad everything's okay. Uh, people you work with, your friends are okay. So you know, that's what you yeah. Ask everybody for. for in Italy, it seems like it was more of an H and B. It's probably the yeah. best way to describe it. Yeah, I mean, I I think someone was saying that the thing literally Estelle was on the southwest part of this thing, um, so it was kind of right at the edge there when it started curving north, or they were just getting some of the bands or something. But I I mean, I heard it was still a significant event there too. Yeah. Not, not like they need an excuse to have flooding in the streets in Estelle. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, I guess one more just curiosity question. You mentioned mudslides. So, like, Pan American Highway, for example, which is, like, the main artery, you know, that grow out, is that very prone to mudslides? And could that shut down the Pan American Highway at times? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, look, you got to remember, the, the vast bulk of the Pan American, I mean, north of Tippy Tapa. I can't remember the exact year. It was like, what, 95-ish mm-hmm. when they paved it, I think. It was like 95 or 96. It was somewhere around then. And that sounds right to me. Some, somebody that there will correct me on that, but that's in my memory. It used to not be paved north of Tippy Tapa. And just for reference, Tippy Tapa is what, 12 kilometers north, uh, north of where Managua is. So pretty much the entire stretch all the way to the Honduran border was a dirt road. Uh huh. So that was always a problem every single rainy season. And there were parts of it that would collapse every single rainy season and there would be delays. Now, after they paved it, there's only a couple stretches that are problematic. Um, there's that one stretch that's on the first set of really big uh, mountains, hills, whatever you want to call it, where you first get the double lanes going out to the kind of the when you cross into that first major valley um that area pretty much was guaranteed to wash out pretty much every single year and finally about i don't know four or five years ago the government really put some serious investment into figuring out the drainage and Mm -hmm. building up the road bed so that hasn't happened for about four or five years and then the other place that we've always struggled with is that stretch just south of esteli um, where we were always having road collapses there. Just as you were coming into the town of Esteli, uh, that section would. And when you drive there, you see it's the part that they have. They've now kind of stepped it out. They've cut that side of that mountain yes. into step. And they've mm-hmm. put up the, the chicken wire walls. It's heavier duty than chicken wire, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, they've basically mesh the entire face of that cut. That, that's always been problematic. And then the other area that's always been a bit of a problem um, is the bridge in Sabaco. Um, the bridge in Sabaco has always been something that's been a problem. And in Esteli itself, what was always a problem was the little bridge, because there used to be only one way to cross over to get over to Rosario. That's the side of Esteli where the state factory is. The west side, yeah. And the only bridge there was, was there. right. The only Bridger was, it used to be that really low, sl- the bridge is still there. It's like what, two foot above the, the, the water level. So that would flood every single year. But then they built the, the new bridge. I don't know the name of this street, but it's the street that the Drew Estate Factory is actually on. It's the one that when you're in Esteli, you make the left-hand turn at the jewelry store. Yep. It's painted teal. Okay, that, that bridge, they built that. They built that bridge the same year we finished off the Drew Estate Factory. So that would have been what, 2006, 2007? I can't even remember, man. It's so long ago. But it was right around then. So since that bridge went in, the other bridge still washes out and floods, but you now have another way to get across. So it isn't as problematic as it used to be. It was actually part of the deal when we were building the new factory was to work cooperatively with the uh, local government to get that new bridge built because we knew we were going to have to have it. There was just yeah. no way we could operate that factory in Rosario without a way to get across the, across the river for, you know, sometimes weeks and weeks on end. Yeah. I know I, I'm, 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 because I've been on a couple of times now. I, I exactly know what you're, what you're talking about. And then you make a left once you get off the bridge and then the Georgia state factory is on the right. Is, do I have that? I think I'm, you're a little screwed up, but it's okay. <laughs> okay, I'm 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 picturing it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So that's that's some good news. But Steve, I mean, looking at 2020, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think you've had a, a. I mean, you could you could talk at a high level and we get into some of the things in a little bit. But 
I think you've had a really good year. I think you came off a really good year, despite what was reported otherwise. I thought you came off a very good year in 2019. And um, 2020, I mean, so how do you kind of, uh, what's the state of Dumbarton hey, Tobacco Trust? What do you mean reported otherwise? Who, who reported we had a bad year in 2019? I don't I, I just, Someone said, someone said, I, that goes back to the Abe show where someone said, I thought you didn't do many things exciting in 2019. And I disagreed with that. Oh, that was you that said that. But I did not say that. that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, whoever said that? No, we had a great year. We, uh, you know, we, uh, we nearly doubled up in 2019, which was phenomenal. And, uh, and then uh, this year, we were doing really fabulous January and February it was probably going to be, it was probably even going to be better than 2019. And then, well, then March and April came and March and April just sucked. They were <laughs> awful. I mean, just brutally bad. Right. But when we got to the tail end of April, Things just started to click and we've been like fired out of a cannon ever since the end of April. So, I mean, I mean, how do you judge a good year versus a bad year? I mean, is it judged on sales? Is it judged on products? Is it judged on how you feel about the day? I mean, I can tell you right now, I think 2020 sucks. <laughs> yeah. right. I mean, I'm, I'm so fed up with the whole thing. It's been all I've done all year long is just fight everything. Fight logistics, fight packaging material, fight tobacco deliveries, fight import of cigars, you know, uh, sales, not sales patterns, because there are no patterns, okay, it's just these wild, crazy swings, I mean, it's just, it's gotten to be just so, it's been an incredibly difficult year to manage, I mean, and uh, I mean, sales-wise, yeah, we're having a great sales year. I think we've had some really, really great product releases this year. I think the product releases we've had have been well received. So, I mean, yeah, from that measure, yeah, I think we're having a great year. Me personally, I gained like 40 pounds this year. I'm <laughs> fucking miserable, man. I mean, I'm stressed. Look, I lost my hair this year. It's crazy. I mean, it's been, it's been, a, it's been a tough year. And, it's, um, and every time you think it's going to turn around, it just keeps being one thing after another. It just doesn't stop. I mean, we're, we're, we're not through this by any stretch. And the other thing too is, does anyone have any clue what 2021 is going to look like? I don't know where this economy is <laughs> heading. I don't know where my sales are heading. I mean, if I base it on the numbers I have now, well, then guess what? I, I'm, 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 I'm the next out to this next year, right? Is that what's happening? I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, it's like it's impossible there's just no way to and it makes it impossible to plan yeah. and of course the other thing too is i'm gonna have a real problem next year with product um you know i have a few things that were in the can that were like finished and ready to go packaging stuff and all that nonsense but i can bounce but i mean new cigar development that's been on hold for me since february i i don't i don't do any of that stuff remote I like to be there. I like to yeah. do everything myself. I like to make those first bench samples. Do I make the best cigars on the planet? Hell no. The, the samples I make are shitty as hell, but I like to make them. I like to smoke them myself. I like to do everything. So, and you know, as well as I do, because of the way the FDA went down, companies next year, oh, there's going to be an avalanche of new stuff. Yeah. Oh my goodness. You know, well, I mean, it's going to be just, it's going to be mind bending how much new stuff is going to be in the marketplace next year. And because for a lot of these companies, you know, they, they don't, they don't do that. They have people that do all that for them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And those people who have been there the full time and they're just bouncing samples back and forth. Oh yeah. You know, I like the one that was in baggy three, you know, so but that's, <laughs> that's not how I like to operate. So no, it's, it's, it's a bit of a challenge. And it isn't over. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying that, and I have some things that were done, but I was really kind of saving them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I have some things that I was thinking, okay, this is going to be good for year 10. And this might be a good year for when I want to, you know, so, but I, I may be forced to, I may be forced to prematurely pull them out, yeah. you know, which, you know, I mean, I know it doesn't mean anything to, to you or to consumers, but it kind of screws with my master plan of what I don't just make stuff willy nilly. Right. 
there's always a reason why I add something. There's a purpose for it. There's a strategy in it. There's a reason why I'm doing what I'm doing, what I'm doing. And look, this year got totally messed up. Look at the end of this year. It's a disaster for my limited productions. Mm -hmm. They're all, I mean, it's gonna be like 30 days of nonstop soccer limited production. <laughs> okay. But that wasn't the plan. The plan was, I mean, look, my unicorns are like shipping now. Well, those were supposed to ship in June. You know, uh, the firecrackers were supposed to go on sale in August. You know, the famous 80s were supposed to happen in September. The red meat lovers were supposed to happen in November. You know, that, that's what was supposed to happen. And what's now happened is I basically have unicorns, firecracker, famous idiot, and red meat lovers. They're like all going to be within 30 days of one another. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's, it's, nothing has gone the way it was supposed to go. And, and, you know, and, and I was happy to just kind of hold back and say, look, let's just delay this. But none of the retailers want to delay it. Yeah. They're all like, no, as soon as you have it, we want it. And I'm like, okay, okay, but I, I don't know. It's, a, it's an awful lot of stuff, you know? And so I, I worry about it, you know, because I don't want, I'm, I understand that consumers can only buy so much. Mm. And I also understand that, like you were talking about the podcast, it gets to a point where you're cannibalizing. Well, yeah. the last thing I want to do is cannibalize myself. You know, and that's, that's, you know, that's kind of what I worry about. Certainly, certainly, but at the same time, you know, if, if these customers, you know, I, like I said, we'll see what happens. I, I have a lot of real look. This year's firecracker release, it's probably the best one. Nice. Um, these firecrackers are really potent. I mean, these ones, just, just the way the tobacco worked out. I mean, just this particular crop of broadleaf that I was working from, it's just got a really, it's really, they're really nice. I think that, I think the people that like the firecracker are going to extra like this firecracker. The famous idiots that I did, they're identical to the famous idiots from last year. Mm -hmm. Smoke them side by side. I can't tell the difference other than the fact that there's a year of age between them, but right. they're, they're spot on. You know, nice. this year we changed the red meat lovers. We're coming out with a six by fifty-two box press. Nice. It's a little bit more potent. I think the I think the guys that really like red meat lovers, I think they're going to be really pleased with the red meat lovers. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you know, there's it's a lot of good stuff, but it's just all on top of one another. Yeah. You know. And, yeah. And and look, I haven't I haven't even I haven't and I still got I mean. I really guess I have blue on top of that too, right? Yeah. I mean, blue, blue is just screaming. Every place I send blue to, they seem to run out of it almost instantaneous mm -hmm. for the most part. And, uh, and look, brulee is on fire and everything is up. There's nothing, there's nothing right now that's not doing good. Good. Even, good. even my worst sellers are doing real numbers. Nice. It's just, well, it's just the way it is. Huh? Yeah. From from the podcast that I heard you do earlier in the year, it sounded like that that as far as your 2020 plan goes, you weren't planning on a major line release. You were planning on some of these extensions that you mentioned, Tricky Traka line extensions, the blue. Yeah. That was your plan all along. So that didn't that didn't affect that. My my twenty my 2020 plan as far as releases didn't get screwed up in any way from a product point of view. It's just the timing of the way they went. Right, right. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like. You know, Brulee Double Corona, it was meant to launch in March because that's when things start to move again in our cigar business. That's when most of the retailers start doing real numbers. People start going out and playing golf. They get outside. Brulee is doing great. So adding a big Brulee Double Corona made a lot of sense in March. Well, it made absolutely zero sense in March, okay? But mm, the cigars are already here. So we didn't really, we didn't really, we didn't really launch it. We kind of let our retailers know we had it, but we didn't really like promo it or debut it or do any of the normal stuff that you would do. It's kind of hard to make a big deal out of a new cigar in the month of March of this year, right? So that kind of goes by the wayside. Um, same thing even with the Tricky Traka. Part of it with the new Tricky Traka sizes, 
what you're hoping is you're hoping you're going to go to a trade show and you're going to make it part of a package deal. Well, cigar sales have been so strong for us since the tail end of April. I got no way to even do any sort of, I got no way to do any packages for the retailers. There's no way I can say, okay, you know, here we got the new Tricky Traka 652. We got the 764. Here you go. Here's a way to debut it in your store. You know, you take all four facings, you buy two boxes of each. We give you some sort of discount, which would have happened with the trade show. And, you know, it would end up where, but I never had enough of the 552s or the 648s to ever make that happen. And the 652s came a full two months earlier than the 764s came. You know what I mean? And they also came two months late of when they were supposed to come. So it's just, it's been this way the whole year. It's just been constantly just staggering from this to that. There's been no steady flow of anything. I ran out of Sobra Mesa packaging, you know, and then I couldn't get the paper and then I couldn't get the powder and then I couldn't get the ink. And then, you know, finally get all that together. And then, oh, they make a mistake in the print and have to reprint. All and it's, just, it's been delay after delay after delay this year yeah. and it's just been the way the whole year has been everything has been a fight everything across the board so i don't know man you would have thought it's been a great year to catch up on stuff but it really has been a year of just putting out fires mm-hmm. that's really what the year has been about wow wow you know? oh. and, I, and i don't think i'm in a unique situation mm-hmm. i think that this is probably the situation for a lot of companies now maybe the people that you talk to you know they're not they're not worried about the powder that goes on the bands right there's people that handle that and they're not worried about the tobacco you know what i mean because they got a lot of people that are doing a lot of different things because they're much bigger organized companies than we are but i mean this all falls to me and it's just it's been a nightmare so for me i'm i'm done with it i don't even if you could tell me right now I could give up 30% of my sales of this year and for it to have been more normal, I would have been okay with that. Right <laughs> That's the way I feel. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, if, if that was the option right now, if you ask me at this moment, yeah, I'd be okay. Because you understand, you got retailers that are upset with you. You got consumers that are upset with you. Everybody is upset with you all the time. I mean, it's a nightmare. And that's, it was really the reason we stopped, you know, we stopped opening new accounts in August because we were getting so back ordered, we couldn't take out of existing accounts, you know, and, and even simple things that you think are just like, I haven't had Umbagog trace since, since February, right? Shouldn't be a big deal. Box maker, you get Umbagog trays, take them about eight weeks to get them in the country. I literally got the Umbagog trays this yeah what day are we wednesday yeah. i got them last thursday they're all the wrong size don't want to reach out. so i waited all the way since february to get these darn things they finally land and they're all wrong <laughs> frustrating no it's, it's it is I, I and had i been in nicaragua like i normally am every month this wouldn't happen because I would see it with my own two eyes and I would say to somebody, what are you fucking stupid? You don't know how to use a fucking tape measure. You, you have a sample. Look, it's got my signature on it. It's here for a reason. So that way you can always compare it, right? Simple, basic, simple stuff. I had a whole shipment coming that was too wet. I couldn't sell any of it. Yeah. It all had to be returned. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm not selling wet cigars to anybody. I, I desperately needed those cigars, but what am I supposed to do? I'm not, I mean, if they're not right. I can't, I can't sell them. My factory partners know that. I mean, look, they make good on them, but them making good on it doesn't help me. And that's the type of stuff that just wouldn't happen if I was able to go every month. Not to mention new product development. Sure. No, um, that was actually one of my questions because, like I said, normally we've seen your journeys and you, you're very hands-on down there. So, so 
that could affect you saying some of the stuff for 2021 right now, because obviously you're not hands on with that right now. Right. 2021 is like I said, I have some things in the kitty, but I really didn't want, I don't want to use them. They're right. not, they're not right. I, I had, I had a very definite plan for 2021 and I could still get there if I live in Nika the first couple months of, of 2021. I can get there by the time that we get the trade show. Um, but who knows? Is there a trade show? Right now, there's two trade shows, right? They're like on top of one another. Yep. So like, what are they now? Six weeks apart or some nonsense? They're, Anyways. yeah. Five weeks apart, six weeks apart? There are, I mean. I think it's about 10, actually. No. It's, no, you're what right. It's middle, middle May, beginning of July, right? Yeah, yeah so it's not that. July. I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah, so, I'm thinking, yeah you're right. So maybe yeah. maybe eight nine weeks, but I mean, yeah. still, what do I think that my customers are going to go to both trade shows? There's one thing when there's one at the end of January, yeah, and there's another one in July, right? Okay, sure. There's going to be some people who live in crappy cold weather states like I do. They're going to say, "Hey, let me go to Vegas for the weekend. Let me check this out." You know what I mean? But at this point, this is really going to be a choice. You're going to be a brick and mortar retailer who is my primary customer because the bulk of the TPE customers aren't my customers. Most of the guys that most of the people that are buying cigars at the TPE for all practical purposes are more DTO uh, that's discount tobacco outlet mm -hmm. style businesses for the listeners. And they're looking for cheap bundles. Well, you guys know, I don't make anything cheap. So that kind of cuts me out. So the only thing that I really have at the show is those brick and mortar retailers that decide, Hey, what the heck? I'm going to go to Vegas end of January. Um, but I don't, I mean, if retailers are now going to have to make a choice as to which one they're going to go to the one at the end, middle of May, or the one at the beginning of July, they ain't going to both. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sure. Are there 12 retailers that might go to both? Yeah. Great. But I mean, we all know the bulk of the retailers are not going to go to both. Right. And if you're a retailer, I don't care how much people complain about PCA. If I had to choose between going to PCA and TPE, if you're in the premium segment, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. It's not even a question. You're going right. to go to PCA, yep. right? You're not going to TPE. Yeah. If you're the discount tobacco outlet guys, yeah, you'll go to TPE. Yeah. But even the DTO guys, they're going to feel the need to go to PCA possibly. I don't know. It's just, I don't know what's going to happen with that either. Who knows if either of those trade shows are going to happen. Exactly. Uh, so are you planning on doing both or just one? Well, right now, look, I already paid for both. I paid for both in advance. Right. So right. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they both have had my money. Yeah. You know? I mean, uh, the PCA people got my money back in uh, what? 2019. Right. So that was July of 2019. They have my money and the TBE people, they got my money in uh, what was it, the end of January, early February of this year. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, so so, so, Steve, here's what I think the X factor is with TPA, is if they do the incentive program for the retailers, then there'll be then there'll be some who go to both. It, that I think is a big. If, if I think that's gonna be a big thing. Yeah, but you know what? Look, TPE doing the incentive program is really just them buying attendance. Yeah, but they're not I mean, buying. Like you say, they they're not. You didn't see they were buying as much as at PCA. Well, I'm sure that, look, I'm sure there's a lot, like we did decent at TPE. We didn't set the world on fire, but it was nice. It was worth the investment we made. And I mean, all in, I think between Lafferty and me, I think we probably spent 10, 12 K maybe out of pocket mm -hmm. to do TPE. So the amount of sales we did at TPE at the end of January, more than made it worthwhile. Right. Okay. Um, you know, but it's hard to envision where, it's going to make sense this year, but I've already paid for the booth. And the other thing too, is what they don't, what I don't think the TPE guys, and again, this has to do with how your company is structured. There's no way if the trade show is in the middle of July that I can afford to go to Vegas in the middle of May. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's just like utter crunch time at the factory level yeah. for getting everything yeah. done that you need to get done to be ready for PCA. Right. So I think you're going to have a lot less principles going to TP, but who knows? 
maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'll have my shit together by then. Maybe I'll be like, hey, yeah, I can go to Vegas. What the heck? You know, I, I don't know. But I just know in a normal cycle, May is not a good month to do anything. Right. You know, you get to the middle of May and until the trade show, you're pretty much totally tapped out. Yeah. Yeah, at the, just... yeah, and at the same time, if you're TPE, though, you made the right decision because they weren't going to have their show in January. It, you know, this is we're in November right now, and I don't think Vegas – Vegas has opened up more from what I understand, but there's still limits on, right. on, on capacity right now. They have some weird ways they can do it. They could like, create these pods, I heard, or something like that. Yeah, and but, do it and look, let's be honest. For them, look, we're the new thing they're trying to add to their show. Yeah. But we're we're not we're not the primary focus of TPE at this point. It's a growing focus. I mean, I looked at the I looked it's at the floor. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But what they're thinking in their head is they're thinking about how do we protect ninety percent of what our customer base is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Ninety percent of our exhibitors, ninety percent of our attendees. These are their current customers. They're not worried about sky. I don't believe in any. I do not. I know some people speculate that. Oh, they're doing this to put a direct shot at the PCA. I don't believe that's the case at all. I think what it was is they came to the realization that the end of January is probably not going to happen. Well, I so agree with when you. do we think it really will happen? And the best we can do is this block here. Uh, and they know internally, they know that this is going to cut into their premium cigar for a year. Okay, there's no way that it can't. But I don't I don't think anybody that thinks conspiracy wise, this is them gunning for the, 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 the other trade show. I don't believe, I don't believe this move to May, that's the reason why they did the move to May. I think they did the move to May because of just the logistics of yeah. January, it's not possible. So when can we do it? Because we have a lot of customers to serve. And even though it won't be ideal for our premium handmade cigar customers, it really is the best we can do for 90% of our base. And you can't fault them for that. Um, I agree, except I also think that now that they're in May, they have no choice but to put a best front forward here. And if it means at the PCA's expense, it's going to mean at the PCA's expense. So I think, right, I don't think, I think they had a choice to move it. They had an opportunity to move the window. They made the right call because they weren't going to have this thing as is in, 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 in January. It's very clear now. So it was the right call. And but But they're talking about moving it back to January for 2022. So... I mean, I don't think it's a permanent thing either. No. Yeah. And I see what Jay is saying. I saw him in the chat. He says, I agree the move to May wasn't to kill. I think it's in their general. That's their plan. Yeah, I won't argue that. I mean, yeah, that's what we said. Yeah. Trying to take business away from PCA. Yeah, they're competitors. It's just that simple. Yeah. I, I think that's always been part of the deal. But I don't think this particular move was for that reason. Right. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree on that one. Steve would we'll see. Yeah. But I think the big issue is we just have no clue what 2021 yeah. brings any of us. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Steve, some of the, I have a few questions on some of the products here. Um, you mentioned the tricky truck of fire. It's a tricky truck of firecracker, correct? Yes. So the original. It's always been the tricky truck that, of blend. It's just this year it has the red bands on it. Is it, so it's this, is it the same blend or did you amp this up again for the firecracker? No, no, it's the same blend. It just happens that the broadleaf crop that this particular year's cigars that the tricky chakas are being made out of, it's just the darks are just a lot thicker and a lot more lush. Yeah. So, nice. and I think, you, and I think you even see that I'm seeing it. You already see it trickling in on the, on the, on the, on the other tricky chakas, the other tricky chakas, you'll notice they're, they don't have quite as reddish a hue as the darks had in the first cup in the first year. You're starting to notice a, a lot more, a lot darker, and it's even a little bit more oily. I mean, it's just difference in the cycle. So I think that they're just a little bit more. Now, there's a downside to that. Um, the burn line isn't as clean, yeah. um, you know, on the current tricky trocas that was last year, in my opinion. But that's part of the texture of the wrapper, um, you know. But uh, I mean, the problem—the problem—it's it's always with broadleaf. And luckily, I made this decision back in December. You always have to decide when to arrest a bulk. I mean, do you keep pushing a bulk to achieve a certain color? Do you keep pushing a bulk to achieve a certain what? It's always a little bit of a compromise as to 
when do you decide to 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 pull that tobacco from fermentation and it's part of the the the, the art slash science whatever you want to call it is just making those judgment calls and uh so but uh yeah i think that uh i just think i find it a little bit i find it i just find it a little more potent to me um stfu uh the sampler i thought it was a brilliant move uh way to sell five cigars at once um which i thought was a brilliant move i thought it was a fun exercise i enjoyed going through it how do you assess how that project went i think it was i think it was good for you yeah, I think it was really good too. And I, it turned out, I, I was actually surprised by the amount of participation. Um, I didn't think it would look, honestly, when I posted that graphic, the graphic was a bit of a goof. <laughs> there was a graphic before there was ever a product. I mean, it was one of those things. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, and we actually had to stop, we cut the orders off on it because I don't remember, Laffrey will know, we sold like 3,000 or 3,500 of them or whatever. And you got to remember, every cigar that ended up in that pack didn't end up in a Brule Toro box. And I've been so yeah. far behind on Brule yeah. Toros yeah. that I just, we finally ended up saying, okay, this is the last, this is it, and had to cap it. But uh, I was really, I was really, um, I was really pleased with it. In fact, um, look, and I'm, I'm sure that the success I had with that, I think a lot, you know how we are, we're in an industry of people that duplicate pay homage let's call it homage mm -hmm. okay and uh i think you're gonna see more stuff like that i would imagine i don't know whether other companies can pull it off because it requires a lot of interaction with the public you know what i mean in order to make it successful and i know that you say oh well that's not so hard to do but if it wasn't so hard to do everybody would be doing a better job of it and for the most part they don't so I don't know how that would work. Um, I know that in my 2021 calendar, there's another project like that. That's awesome. You know, because everyone found it enjoyable. And so, you know, I, I have some other, I have some other ideas that, you know, we won't get into whether it was sweet tipped or not kind of sweet tip conversation like this one was, but you know, I don't know that it'll be as successful as STFU. But I think it, it'll be it'll be interesting to do, and you know, as long as you know, look, these type of things they're not uh, they're not taxing. You know, yeah. I, I don't want to. I, I mean, you guys can come yeah. up with ideas yourselves. I'm sure just the audience that are listening, they can come up with three or four different types of samplers that they would enjoy doing. You know, what I mean, I, I don't want to throw them out there because at least let other people come up with their own ideas before I give away mine. But I, I think uh, I, I think the amount of consumer engagement, and not so much the amount of sales, because in the end, let's get honest about it. I mean, it's nice to sell 3,500 five count cigars, but it's really only what 17,000 or so cigars. It's not something that's going to move the dial. You know what I mean? You, you don't get rich selling 17,000 cigars yeah. at a company our size. You know, you're happy to have it. Don't get me wrong, but. It's more about just the exercise of doing it and the engagement and that. And I was really, I was really pleased with that. So uh, I, look, it's right up my alley being a cigar geek. I, it's the type of stuff that we always do all the time at the factory level. Yeah. You know, heck, we all have that question. Oh, I'm going to throw out an idea. Never mind. I was about to say something. I'm not going to do it. But so some of the ideas that came in are like uh, petite versions of multiple lines and things like that. Right, but that's not anything that isn't. I'm talking about something more that requires some assessment on your part okay, as, a, gotcha. as a smoker. Yeah. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, okay, what about, okay, these cigars have fillers that have only been aged six months. These ones have fillers, the same crop that's a year and a half old from the same farm. This one's, you know, three years old. Exact same blend, same proportions, same farm, same everything, but the age difference. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or, you know, this is one that has, you know, uh, Ecuador Habano and you're taking it from the same crop cycle and okay, well, these are all third and fourth primings and these are all fifth and sixth primings okay. and these are seventh and eighth primings and, you know, us not telling you which ones they are, all the blends are identical. The only difference is the primings. Okay. You know, can you really tell the difference? Yeah, yeah that's a great, that's is, there, a great... is there an appreciable difference? 
You know what I mean? So there's a lot of ways that you can do this. And it's never going to be something you're going to make a lot of money on. But it's something that's really kind of interesting. That's fun. And it's different. And look, I mean, we can only take so much political nonsense on social media. So I'd rather see more posts about people debating about, you know, cigar X versus cigar Y versus cigar Z. Right. And then, so I, I, I was actually surprised by the level of engagement. It, I was it, really, I was really impressed by it. It was a lot of fun. It was, a, I can tell you, we did it on the air. You know, Bear and I had a lot of fun doing it. We, we got three or five each, right? Um, so we didn't do great, but it was fun. It made us think. And some of the stuff you're suggesting is like, yeah, bring it I mean, I think, I think it'll be, Look, it's educational. Think, it's educational. You guys, were, you guys were smoking them all together at the same time, right? Yeah. That makes it hard because once you get the sweetness of one in your mouth, yeah, you know, how do you how do you clear your way for the next one? Yeah, yeah, we're I gonna mean, do two so. next. We're gonna do two next time as the plan, and try to smoke, smoke them one pack beforehand, and then smoke it on the air. Because I think that was and ha, Steve, I think we said this. We went backwards in the pack. I think if we went forward, our results would have been different for the reason you said. I think it was thank yeah, goodness possibly. we went backwards. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's just, uh, but like I said, it seemed like everyone enjoyed it. Yep. And heck, as long as I'm getting my 12 bucks or whatever <laughs> the cigars cost that are in the pack, I'm happy to do it. Right. You know what I mean? I mean, in this case, it was expensive. It doesn't have to be that expensive, but they were Brulee Toros. So, you know, Brulee Toros are $12.45. Basically, the only savings there was was there was no boxes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But, the reality is, you know, even even printing stupid stickers like that, when you're printing them in such low quantities, they're not as cheap as you would think. You know what I mean? And the thing with this one, too, it was really a problem was the factory had to, I was really worried about them screwing it up and mixing the different levels of sweetness between the bands. Yeah. You know, but they did a good job. But the way that worked was they did all of S's. This was S day. Yeah. This was T day and this was F day. And there was never any. And until those were done, you couldn't move on to the next ones. And they all had to be bounded and they all had to be cellophane all together. There was no, oh, we're going to sweeten them. And then we're going to put them on the shelf. And then we're going to bring them back out. And then we're going to ban them. And this girl's the F girl. And that girl over there is doing the S's because that would have been a total cluster mark. Yeah. And, that, and that, that was the thing that I was most fearful of is that that was going to happen. And I don't think that happened at all. Now, I know some packs got double Fs, but they got double Ss where they actually got two of the same banded cigars. But I smoked through, I don't know, I smoked through like five of them randomly and then I probably smoked another two or three. So I smoked probably eight packs roughly. And they were they were dead on for me, at least in all my eight packs. But that's the beauty of it. You can always just say the factory screwed up. That's why you got it wrong. <laughs> no, I mean, in, in I that means, just prove any of that. <laughs> I mean, we we picked up some differences between uh, the F and the U, which were two of the sweetened ones. And and I guess the way you made it, made it when they were the one made, that kind of makes some sense now. Um, because maybe it was I don't know. We felt maybe one was a little more sweet than the other is what we kind of thought. Well, and the cigars were all the cigars were all from the same production. Got it. Okay, okay. but the the sweetness was done on different days. Got it. Got it. that makes sense. Um. So the other one I want to just mention is um Sober Mesa Blue. Um. You've got to be very very. I mean, you talked about it earlier. Got to be very pleased. Um. I'm gonna make a a prediction here. Um. So Steve, Sober Mesa Blue is your key to winning the consensus this year, in my opinion. Uh -huh. Okay, I think it's your best shot to win the consensus is this year. Um, here's here's how I think, I, but here's the question: I don't know how Charlie's going to curate blue versus the rest of Sober Mesa Blue. Egg. I think if he if he groups blue in with everything with the rest of Sober Mesa Blue, egg, you'll win it. If he keeps it separate, I think you still have a chance to win it. I have no idea. I mean, I don't know how. I'm not going to ask I'm, him how he's going to do. It. That's his choice. But that's I'm seeing this is your best shot this year. Like, I can't complain about the consensus. No. I mean, what have I been? Number two, number two, number three, number two. Right. And I think every single year I've had two to three cigars in the top 
on the consensus list. The only year I didn't have at least two on the list was year number one because the only cigar I had was the regular Sober Mesa. So, I mean, anything I get on the consensus is really, yeah. really gravy. I mean, look, I'm not, a, I'm not a moron. Do I want to do well? I always want to do well. I'm competitive. Sure. I mean, do I think my products are worthy of being considered? I think they're all worthy of being considered. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you know as well as I do, Coop. Yeah. This this run is crazy. Yeah. I mean, no no other company has done as well in the last five years. And just imagine if Cigar Aficionado actually rated my cigars, mm -hmm. or if Cigar Journal rated my cigars, or I mean, there's about four or five of the people that are in that list that they've never rated any of my products at all. They haven't rated them badly. They just haven't rated right. them. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? And I think the I think the one year the I think the one year I like I was like literally like point zero zero one two behind Dabo. You know what I mean? All it would have taken is just to end up on one more rating somewhere as number twenty two. And I would have, you know, been number one that year. But in the end I've always said this. In the end, consumers end up ultimately deciding. You can just tell by the sales. Yeah. Is it sustainable? Is it not sustainable? Do they continue to buy it? Do they go back to it? Do they add it to their rotation? How do they talk about the company? How do they talk about the brand? You know, I mean, I mean, that's really kind of, I mean, look, and there's some brands that are talked very poorly of. And yet their sales are amazing. I mean, the ideal scenario is to have your brand talked well about and your sales be good too. I mean, that's the ideal circumstance and we've been pretty blessed with that. But look, don't, don't, don't anyone get delusional out there. We're still a very small company. I mean, we're, we're not rolling in cash. We're, we're a long way away from, I don't think, I don't consider us established. But of course, that's also coming from the JR Cigar perspective when I was an exec there, and then coming from the perspective of an exec at Drew Estate. I mean, we're, yeah. we're, you know, we're just in the grand scheme of things, Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust is peanuts. It just is. Well, you got to be very pleased, especially like Sober Mesa. Because as a brand, that that's one that's been on the consensus multiple times, and you know it's an it's your oldest brand. Granted, five years is still a long time in this industry. I know what's new. So really you gotta be really you gotta be really I mean, pleased with that, yeah. You know what I'm really pleased about is, I mean, even this year, I think regular sober Mesa is up like thirty points. You know, so if regular sober Mesa is still growing thirty points in its fifth year, that's a really really good sign. Yeah, I mean that's really nice. It, it means that it it has a shot. Yeah, absolutely, know? absolutely. So, I mean, yeah. Look, I'm I'm happy. I'm 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 not unpleased as to whether blue. I don't know. I, I don't, this year is so messy, though. I don't think anybody got a good launch on anything, did they? You guys know I better than so. I do. No, You're no, but they. More than, did anyone get a really nice? you know juicy you know launch that you see a lot of buzz about and people are excited like oh i gotta try that i mean has there been what, what cigars have been in that category there's, i don't think there are any there aren't few i mean that's why i'm looking at blue i think here's the thing steve with blue a lot of the reviewers have their hands on it and i think that's going to be the key to winning it this year and a lot of and, it's, it's and, and, and you know it's doing I'll well say this and in the interest of full disclosure, and Aaron knows this, you know this, for the last three years, I haven't sent samples out to the media. No, that's because true. What happens is you guys come to the trade show and you get your samples at the trade show. Right. Well, this year there was no trade show. So this year I put together a little pack, okay, of the cigars that the media guys would have gotten at the trade show. And I, and I sent them out. Okay. So, hey, maybe that'll make the difference. I don't know. But I sent the cigars to, I sent the same cigars pretty much to everybody. I think in your case, Coop, I think I sent you uh, Grand Buffaloes because I know you like to smoke those horse dick sized cigars. Uh, that explains it. Aaron and I were just talking about that. Yeah, I'm actually yeah. really, 
I'm very intrigued to smoke that size with versus yeah. like smoking. Yeah. So I'm excited about that. So I sent you that cigar because I know that you, you tend to like those, you know, yep. those gigantic. Yeah. But for the most part, everybody got the same thing just as though they come to the trade show. So it was a little different, you know what I mean? Uh, but at the same time, a lot of people that I sent those cigars to, they've actually already reviewed the cigars I sent them. I don't know how they do it. I keep saying I don't know yeah. how they do it, but it's amazing. Well, I, I know how they do it a little, but yeah. But I think, Steve, I'm, in fairness, I think a lot of people want to smoke your stuff right away. So they're excited about it. I think that's a good thing. Um, so your stuff probably will get smoked before some other things. It's just the reality of, of how media is working. And in the end, like I said, I think that's going to help you when, when it's going to come to these come to the end of the year. Samples are no samples. I think a lot of guys bought your stuff too. But I think blue is yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. I think most of them bought. Yeah. I mean, because I saw the reviews. I've seen the reviews on most of the sites already. So I mean, there's going to be a plethora of them going in. You know how this works. Yeah. It, for the next for the next sixty days, it's going to be nonstop. Look, I have right now like seven reviews to share. But I try not to share. I try to stage them out where it's not like every day, you know, today I could have posted three reviews today. Yep. You know what I mean? You know, but I don't want to post them all on top of one another. Cause going back to, I want to make sure that, you know, these media, so if they take the time to review something, I want them at least to get the clicks to look yeah. at it. You know what yeah. I mean? So if I posted a day, I mean, I think we made like dojos, you know, top, 10 must have always whatever cigars or something. Yeah. I don't even know what it said. I have to go back and look at it. And I just got the cigar press from Thor. And I think we're like like two of his top yep. 20 of whatever. I mean, I think Thor, I don't even know what he calls it, but like recommended must tries for 2020, I think is what, again, I'm just talking out my top of my head, but he has some term that he gives. He doesn't call it a top 20 list. He, right. he has a way for it. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it's already been in a lot of places. You know, the thing I find interesting about Blue is Blue is such a it's such a mellow cigar. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's such a refined style. It's not the type of stuff that reviewers tend to get very excited about. You know what I mean? It's not it's not it's not the normal cigar style genre. Right. You no, know, uh, much more the tricky truck of six four eight or the firecracker. Or something like that would be the style they would, you know, Unstolen Valor. I mean, even though I can't take credit for blending it, I, I think Unstolen Valor was a really, really solid cigar for a lot of for a lot of reviewers this year. I, have, yeah. I, I haven't seen any, I haven't seen any bad reviews of Unstolen Valor. Are there any out there? You guys see them more than I do. Did I miss one? What about you guys, Aaron? <laughs> no, I mean it wasn't like world beating cigar but it wasn't a bad review yeah. uh, i don't think i've yeah. seen any bad reviews of it yeah, I, I don't think i have e yeah i don't think i have either um and i'm curious i think it will make the consensus i think that one will make the consensus just again how i'm like seeing i look at the gauge as who, what's being reviewed uh, and now i'm paying more attention to the youtuber guys this year so that's kind of how i'm gauging this right now um, there's a lot of youtuber guys that i don't even know they exist there's yeah, so yeah. many yeah, the and, way I the way I learn about the YouTuber guys is because someone takes the time to send me a link. Right, they send me an email or they send me a you know a text or something. Yep. Hey, yeah. check it out. I, I would never find them. I I can't keep up with Facebook. Right, and I tried so hard to be better on Instagram, and I've been really slacking on Instagram pretty much all of this year, which seems counterintuitive because you would think I have more free time, so I'd be doing more of that. But I think I've actually done less social media this year. Um, and I think part of it, too, is the podcast. Because for a while there, I was podcasted out. Right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. you, you guys see the podcast. You have no idea how many private Zooms I did with retailers. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were literally there was literally weeks where it was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Right. There was one day I had something twice in that day. You know? It's just it gets to be a lot so i don't uh so i really i like it when people send me the links because it exposes me to stuff that i would n never otherwise see good point that's a good point um i, mean, I, got I one... looked at, yeah go ahead I, looked, I was gonna say i mean 
I know last year looking at the consensus list, I didn't know half the sites that Charlie used to get his ratings for his right. consensus. Well, and it's really like we do we we kind of do some fun prognication. We um but I think we were surprised how many YouTube sites were last year used, which kind of I think threw the consensus off and ended up being Placentia ended up winning it, which I would have never seen that one coming, but I wasn't looking at the YouTube piece as much last year. This year, I'm paying a little more attention to it just to kind of see. And, and, and that's what I'm seeing right now. Um, I think n- some of Nick's stuff's going to get a lot of reviews in the next few weeks. And I think that's going to be another wild card. He came out with his, what, his Goliath and his yeah. David fifth and anniversary as well. Yeah. yeah, the Charter Oak as well. So, get yeah. A lot of- yeah, they're going to get some, they're gonna get some hit play in the, uh, from now until the end of the year. Steve, I had a question about this one release. We didn't talk about it. What is the deal with the U-boat? What is that? What's the deal with that cigar? Yeah, what U-boat is is U-boat is uh, me taking Raul's unstolen valor blend and just tweaking it a little. Um, yeah, look, you're like everybody. You always think you can do better. You know, just kind of the way things are. So, as much as for me, unstolen valor, I really, really like. It but it's a very linear smoke in my opinion. It's just kind of this expression of pepper. Um, it's enough to keep me, I enjoy it. I like smoking it, but I think there was a way to add a little bit more complexity to it, a little bit more depth, a little bit more roundness that I think makes it a more appealing blend um, for me. And so that's what U-Boat was, was U-Boat, was me taking that base Liga that is the Liga of Unstolen Valor and just you know, putting little Sokka touches here and there around the edges, nibbling around it. But I mean, it's still primarily, it was his base blend that I was working from. You know what I mean? And look, and in the end, he's the one that executed the changes. You know right. what I mean? So, I mean, look, he's the one that executes me, K. Rita and Tricky Traka day to day. I'm obviously not doing it. I got my fat ass here in New Hampshire. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, so, I mean, I mean, he's, I mean, they're, you know, look, they're my partners. I mean, you have to have people at the factory, you know, in the case of Nicaragua, it's, you know, Miguel and Michael. I mean, you guys know Mario, but on yep. the factory floor, it's Miguel, Michael, Yesir, those people that are the, you know, day in, day out, hands-on people that are, you know, making sure that, you know, Sober Mesa Brule is the way Sober Mesa Brule is supposed to be. You know, because right now I'm I'm doing everything in hindsight. I get deliveries, and that's been another thing too. I've destroyed so many cigars this year just doing quality control here in New Hampshire. I mean, it's crazy. You know, because I just I feel uncomfortable shipping stuff out that I didn't get to look at. Right. Yeah. No, I get that. I mean, I totally. I've seen you at the trade show measuring humidity on your cigars. So. Yeah, we still I, do that here. We do that here in New Hampshire when we get a shipment in. They can't ship anything out of the warehouse that gets delivered until I personally look at it all. Oh wow, right. that's good. Yeah, I, look, you know how this works. How many how many cigars have you had over the years where they were really good and then they end up really messed up? Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Because you take your eye off the ball, you can't do that. You got to you got to you got to so stay on top of it. It's, it's the it's... only way if you if you want consistency. You just have to be relentless and it's much harder to do after the fact than oh well here i am let me look at everything you know okay let me see what's due to ship out this month okay where are these samples what are they like let me see them oh well this isn't good we need to fix this you know so it's been and it's part of the thing too that that's the reason why i don't like the idea of starting anything new it's hard enough to get them to continually do what they're supposed to do right? when they already know what they're supposed to do, to try to get a new project from the ground up started remotely. It's just stupidity. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and look, and, and so many people do it all the time and you see the results of it and I don't need to name names. I mean, but it's just not a practical way to go. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, it, it, that's a real stumbling block. But I mean, just, just keeping them on track is it's difficult. But it's to start something fresh that they've never made before, that that's not physically possible. 
look, it turns out that the unicorns that we're shipping now, they have a year of age on them. That's never been the intent with unicorns. Unicorns typically are aged about six months. Okay. The way this worked out, these unicorns end up actually having a year of age on them, the ones that we're releasing right now. But guess what else this means? I'm not there to sort the tobacco for the 2021 release of unicorns. Right. Interesting. So yeah, and that's a I big that, that's a big thing that you've done, actually, as I know the story of that, yeah. So I mean, so what do I do? Do I do I I mean there's enough tobacco that was pre-sorted that's been set aside to maybe make 600. Okay, so okay, we get 600 more now. But do I make 600 now and then what? Make the other 400 in January mm -hmm. and then they all ship at the same time, the 1000 and then I'm going to have some that are going to be, you know, 3 months of age difference, 3 4 months of age difference between them. How's that going to work out? Do I make 600 and those end up getting launched in June when they should be launched? And then, you know, three, four months after that, the other 400, that might be the way to go. I, I haven't decided yet. You know what I mean? But I know that pre-sorted tobacco from the previous year, there's only about enough to make maybe six, maybe 700 at the outside. But I don't really know that until they start really look some of it's going to destroy some of it's going to tear some of it's going to be this there's going to be a certain amount that are going to get rejected in quality control you know what i mean so i don't really know the number so you know, these are the questions i i have to ask myself yeah are they capable of making a thousand unicorns that nobody's going to be able to ever probably tell the difference sure they are but then what then i'm lying to the consumer and for what so i can sell an extra 400 cigars I mean, if you're going to lie, let's lie big and at least make some real money. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, 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 isn't, it isn't worth, you know, lying. So you have 400 cigars, you know, early or on time, actually would have been on time. So these are the type of things that, you know, and the other thing too is, and I, I haven't talked much about it. There's a few people that have heard me talk about it in the past because I have a big mouth, but I had something really super exciting for 2021. It was like, it was going to be like a real release and uh and i i'm ready to pull the trigger on it the problem is the work is done on the preliminary end but we've never gone into real production right. and that's why i'm saying if i have to i'm chartering a plane in january yeah oh wow so that we can get into real production because i really 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 want to launch this product next year and if I get down there in January, okay, we, we can do it because all the blending and all the tobaccos and all that's been decided, you know, but, uh, but January is kind of my drop dead. And the thing is, you know, we've been on this kind of every 30 days, we're going to be allowed to fly down there 30 days from now. Mm -hmm. Now the airlines are now saying February. Okay, so now now that they pushed it all the way to February, I'm like that. I can't, I can't keep saying to myself, okay, well, just another thirty days, just another you know another three weeks, and I'll be able to go. I mean, I pretty much had a ticket since June that just keeps getting canceled. Yeah, I've heard this from a lot so, of manufacturers too. Yeah. So hopefully that works out for you. Um, that, that will be. I, I think you'll find a way to get down there too. Yeah, no, I, look, I, like I said, even if I have to spend the money, I will. Now, look, maybe I'll figure, maybe I'll get a cadre of people. Yeah. Maybe I'll cut my $40,000 expense into $10,000 ahead. If I can get yeah. three other people to say, hey, let's, you know, share it, yeah. you, know, you know. But the thing is, that requires a lot of coordination because I know that when I go down, I'm going to be there for at least two to three weeks straight mm -hmm. on this first trip. Here There's you go, no Here's what you do, Steve. I'm going to solve this for you. Go fund me. Or go fund me and give away some unicorns. There you go, Steve. Steve you'll have the $40,000. You'll, you'll, you'll be able to buy a G5. You'll, you'll, exactly. <laughs> hey, hey, you'll be able to buy the plane, Steve. Listen, listen. Hey. <laughs> Help Saka get to Nicaragua. <laughs> 
Uh, <laughs> Picture you with a sign that says Nicaragua or bust. Dude, I right, think we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I can get the Nicaragua the so, you, so you can get yeah. your new release. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, you know, like I said, there's going to be tons of new stuff, and that's going to make it really competitive next year. Because, look, you know how this works. New sells old. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Retailers put more money into the new stuff than they put into the current stuff. It's always the way it is. So you, you almost have to have something new. I mean, generally if you're going to be in a trade show environment, you know, this year because of how disjointed it all was, it didn't, and the other thing too is, I mean, we ended up with such a huge cigar shortage, you know, because, who, I mean, it turned out that people that were smoking one or two cigars a day were now smoking, or one or two a week, they were now smoking three a day because they were stuck at home. And, you know, and I've said this before in other programs, but if you really think about it, if you didn't lose your job, you actually made more money this year than you've ever made because you weren't spending it. You didn't have a summer family vacation. You didn't spend it to go sporting events. You didn't spend it eating out in restaurants. You weren't putting as much gas in your truck. So oddly enough, in some weird way, I know there's a lot of people out there that this has been a very painful economic year, but for those who did not lose their jobs, and were able to work remotely, or they were essential workers that continued to get paid. For a lot of them, this was actually a year where they actually had more free cash. Yeah. Because Susie didn't go to band camp this year. Refinanced their house. Uh, car insurance yeah. went down. Right. I mean, everything. So there are a lot of things this year. And uh, so, that, so, I mean, we ended up in a cigar boom. For sales who at the same time the factories were already slowing down last year because there was a glut of inventory in the marketplace right and then everything like came to a screeching so things were already slowing up for most manufacturers i mean the import numbers last year i think were down what eight nine percent roughly and so you're coming out of january february the point where you just start to gear up is when all of this hit I mean, there were factories that were making 60,000 plus cigars a day that dropped to 20,000 in the months of March and April. And then by the time the realization of, oh my God, this market is all of a sudden on fire, the factories are are way behind. I can tell you right now, I'm going to have more cigars that I've, I've had nothing but problems all years with with inventory. January, I think I'm going to have a boatload of cigars. The absolute worst time to have a boatload of cigars. I'm going to have them in January. Oh, interesting. In time, I don't want to slow anything up because of the way this whole year has been. And I've been inventory strapped all year long. So I'm going to take them all, but at the same time, I mean, the last time in our industry that you want a lot of cigars sitting excess inventory is during the winter. I mean, you normally start scaling your inventory up in March. That's when you start scaling because the bulk of the sales in our business happen between March and, and October. That's the bulk of the sales. That's the way the trends are. December, December dies after you get for our end, not the retailers, but for us, by the time you get to December 10th, you're not really selling very much of anything, mm-hmm. you know, and then January soft and February soft. The retailers do really well in December with your product. January may not be as ugly. We've been very lucky that January's for us typically tend out to be a pretty decent. But a January is never like a, a May, June, or July, or August, or September, or October. And Februarys are normally very soft months. And then everything's dependent on the weather. When does spring start to break? Because it's all relative. I mean, people in Atlanta... 55 degrees outside. That's too damn cold to be outside smoking cigars as far as they're concerned. No, it is. It's true. It's you true. know what I mean? So yeah. so you need for that spring to start clicking in before people end up, you know, outside at their grill and around their around their back deck and, you know, out playing golf or doing whatever. And this year that happened, but COVID happened. And so we did not get the normal spring bump that you expect to get. We actually... I mean, and a lot of manufacturers, the only way they survived was 
they they dumped so much inventory at such aggressive deal prices. Look, consumers have been the benefit of it. And they still see the benefit of it. I mean, look at the price point on so much stuff in the marketplace. I mean, how many brands have been just really devalued in 2020? I mean, can they recover from that? And I don't think we know that answer. We won't know that answer for probably another 12 months. There's a lot of brands right now that are 40 to 70% off. Very true. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it too. Yeah. I'm definitely seeing. Steve, as far as uh, lines go, there was one more line I wanted to hit, and actually Stace Berkland was in the chat reminding me of it too. Um, What's up with Totos Los DS? Anything new we can expect to see from that line? No. Um, Totos Los DS is just going to. You know, Toto Sauce Diaz was the is the only brand that I had that the sales the sales on Toto Sauce Diaz have never done as well as any of the other brands outside of its initial year. So the initial year of Toto Sauce Diaz, the sales were really good, but it became soft in, softer than any of the look. All brands become soft in year two. All brands tend to go soft. It's sometime in year three where you get an idea as to whether. They're going to go up or they're just going to continue to go nowhere. I mean, most, a lot of companies, they don't even get the two, three year cycle. They get basically the, the six to eight months after the trade show and then they go soft. But typically that's the way it ends up working. And so Totos Las Dias has definitely been my slowest grower. It's still, I mean, it's not, it sold the most in year one. It went down like everything else. But it went down faster and it went down lower than anything else I ever made. And then when I did the packaging shift last year, it started to go back up again. But it's not going up at the pace of anything else I made. Toto's last DS is so even though it's growing at this point, even though the brand is doing better, even though it seems to get pretty good comments from consumers. It's definitely the one that is performing the worst in the marketplace for us. Now, a lot of other companies be like, oh, wow, that brand grew 12%. They'd be excited about it. I'm not excited about 12%. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I feel as though I could use that space for something that has greater opportunity. At the same time, though, it is growing. So I haven't made the decision, but eventually I'm going to have to decide, okay, is this worth, you know, making and i'm going to make that decision probably sometime in 2021 but i mean in the end the numbers are going to tell me what it is for me i have mixed feelings about it i mean honestly if you ask me i don't think it's one of my better products oh i love I, it i think it's the, great the, yeah the thick lonsdale to me is one of the best cigars i make i love that thick lonsdale format but in the other sizes it's good. It's fine. It's, you know, I can understand why customers like it. I understand why I put it in a box, but at the same time, when consumers decide they want to smoke a strong uh, Dunbarton, they seem to prefer smoking a tricky truck over a Totos Las Dias. So, you know, it's kind of, and Totos Las Dias is a really weird blend. It's super smooth. And it's super strong, but it doesn't taste strong. It's it's my strongest, but I got to explain it to a consumer that, well, our strongest is Totos Las Dias, but Tricky Traca actually tastes stronger. You know what I mean? It's a very yeah. weird message to try to convey. So essentially, I gave it a, I gave it a facelift, but the facelift was something that just needed to be done because the original packaging just sucked. I just totally... I totally mailed it in on that first release of packaging, not the bands, the bands are beautiful, but the pack, the box mm -hmm. itself. But you know, in my defense, that box was slapped together in the middle of that window of the FDA cycle when we basically had 90 days to do everything we were ever going to do for the rest of our lives. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, that's when that happened. So, you know, it didn't get the, the love and the TLC or the attention that it deserved. And that's my fault, okay? So I fixed that. I'm really happy with how it presents now. I, I think it looks really nice and sharp. And I'm happy with the cigars. But look, 
consumers ultimately make the decision. And if consumers would rather smoke Sober Mesa and Mike Rita and Sin Compromiso, then it's my duty to invest my efforts in there. Hurts because I think Thick Lonsdale is one of my better cigars. I think, I think Thick Lonsdale is in my top 10, personally, mm-hmm. within my whole portfolio of Vitolas. Um, but in the end, it's going to be, it's going to be up to consumers. I'm not going to, but I'm not going to try to force it either. You know, a lot of companies try to resuscitate things. Mm-hmm. They try to make things sell, but you can't really make something sell. In the end, it has to live or die on its own. You know what I mean? Um, and like I said, it's still growing. Numbers are up on the air. Numbers have been going up since I did the repackage on it but they're not going up anywhere near like all the other SKUs and all the other brands. And then also I have to ask myself from a business perspective, look, when Todos Las Dias was a st- one of three brands we had, okay. But now, you know, retailers, you got Sober Mesa, you got Sober Mesa Brulee, you got Mikirita, you got Tricky Traca, you got a full line of Muester de Sacas at this point, you got Sin Compromiso, you got Umbagog, I mean, I have a lot of good products for retailers to decide what to put on their shelves. I can't just add another brand because the universal question every retailer asks is, okay, what brand do you want me to take off the shelf? Yeah. Right? So if ultimately... I may have to make the decision that's in the best interest of the company that, okay... It was the same same decision I made when I was at Drew Estate. When we pulled the plug on Chateau Real, it wasn't because it was a failed brand. Chateau Real sales were growing; it was doing well. We were we were selling we were selling we were selling like three four million dollars worth of Chateau Real when we pulled the plug on the brand. But you also have to ask yourself, okay, what do you see as a long term future? Is this brand going to have the potential to, you know, become a Liga? Is it going to have the potential to become an asset? You know, where do you want to put your efforts? Where do you want to focus your energies? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, because, you know, too many companies, they just kind of, well, I'll keep selling it as long as someone wants to buy it. Well, there's always someone that's going to want to buy. I can tell you right now, there are people out there that Totos Las Dias is their favorite cigar that I make. Yep. There is. I know that. I, I, I get the emails and the, the submissions and the comments. I still see people posting pictures of Tonus Las Dias. Not as many as I see of others, but I still see it. You know, but at the same time, you 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 have these are the type of decisions that you have to eventually make. I'm gonna have to make that decision. At this point, I haven't, but it's the one that I'm looking at the closest. Yeah. I will say this, I'm not gonna close it out. I mean, if anyone's thinking they're going to get a great deal on Todos Las Dias, they're, they're, they're screwed. They're not. I will just I will just dial back production and I will let it go through the system and protect my retailers who've made investments in it. And, you know, I, I'm not I'm not over inventoried on anything. You know what I mean? So it isn't like, oh, wow, I'm sitting on 100,000 extra Todos Las Dias in the warehouse that I don't know how to sell. That isn't the case. I mean, I think right now we, we've been back over on like two totals last Dia skews. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I mean, that's been the case throughout the, we, we constantly are going in and out of stock on that one too. So, but I mean, but I, but I managed the production to try to be in line with the demand. This year has been weird, but I mean, I've always tried, I've, I'm a real big believer in good inventory control. You don't want to have too little, you don't want to have too much. Mm-hmm. You know, because if you properly manage the product, it makes the sales of it much easier. What happens to so many companies is they they get these crazy ideas in their head. They make way too much of something because they think it's going to be amazing and they don't want to miss out on the sales. You, you hear these people all the time talk about opportunity costs. To me, that's just nonsensical bullshit. It's, it's, you might as well gamble. 
You know what I mean? I, I like to do things slow and steady and easy and even. It's better for production. It's better for quality. It's better for sales planning. It's, it's better across all the board. Yes. Does that mean that, okay, there are not enough umbagogs? At some points, yes, there's not enough umbagogs. But look, we sell we sell ten times, twenty times. Who am I kidding? Twenty times the umagogs that we were selling, you know, three four years ago. And as there's demand, and as we have materials, we we make more. And that's one of the things that I've always said to everybody. I, the only thing that's actually truly limited is unicorns. Everything else, if I got the tobacco and we can make it the same quality. I'll make more of it if people want to buy it. There's no reason for you to buy Don Derma at some crazy price. You know what I mean? I'm, I made more Don Derma this year. There's going to be more Don Derma, I think, roughly, again, this is the plan, February. There'll be more Don Derma on the shelf for those people that still want to buy Don Derma. You know, but am I making 5,000 boxes of Don Derma because of all the buzz about it? Hell no, I'm not making 5,000 boxes of Don Derma. You know, and you can't, and you can't let, and you can't let the, you can't let consumers drive it. You can't let the, you, consumers do drive it, but you can't let the sentiment of consumers drive it. Mm. You know what I mean? And you can't let the sentiment, look, retailers, retailers right now, they want me to make 7,000 more unicorns. Right. That's what retailers want. Because they feel as though they could sell them. I don't think they could. I think they're wrong. And I also think that if you made 7,000 unicorns and you flood the market with it, you would see unicorns at half off is what you would end up seeing. Right? Yeah. No, I think it's a way. I mean, You're right. Because that's what happens on everything. Yeah. And, and that's the problem. These, these companies are so bad at managing their, their brands. And a lot of times it isn't that they're bad at the brand creation, the brand imaging and the marketing. They're just so bad at the matching the product flow with the brand sales flow that they find themselves in a position where, oh my God, how are we going to sell these extra 22,000 boxes of X yeah. that we now have had sitting in our warehouse because we thought it was going to do this. And then what they have to do is they have to deeply discount it to get it out the door because they want to cash recover on it. And then how do you ever, how do you ever, how does the brand ever recover? And who does that help? It hurts the retailer. Okay. It breaks faith and trust with the consumer that paid full price for the product. Right. Look, I can think of a major brand right now that if I'm a consumer, I'd be a little irritated that I can buy it for 50% off all the time. I mean, I paid this price, a great cigar, great brand. And I've been paying full boat for the last five years. And now I can buy it for half off anywhere, every day, all the time. Yeah. What does that mean? Does that mean that they were robbing me the previous times for five years? Was the price just grossly overinflated all that time? I mean, I don't even know what, and look, I'm sure most consumers, they kind of like, oh, wow, it's great. I love that cigar. I'm getting a great deal on it. But you know, as well as I do, the perception of what that cigar is changes right off the bat. Okay. Because one of two things have happened. Either you were totally lied to as a consumer or the product is just not the same quality product that they were making. Right five years ago okay because no that, that works yeah. yeah these one time spot kind of this is and that's but when you see a brand that is consistently 40 points off or greater all the time something's happened there okay yeah. you were either lied to or the product isn't as good as it used to be made yeah because there's only so much you can save on the efficiency end that concept of, well, we become more efficient and this and that. Sure. Yeah, you can pick up five points, 10 points. If you're a little tiny guy, you can pick up maybe 15 points. Okay. If you're really like dialed in, but there's no 40% anyway. So, hey, it's just the way it is. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't personally understand it. 
but it also has a lot to do with the way our industry has moved. Uh, you know, our industry has, as we've moved out of the small family, mom and pop, I mean, even companies like General, they used to be family owned and operated. Altidus was not family owned and operated, but the primary stakeholder shareholders were people that worked at the company. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was, it's a much, our industry has changed so much where it's become a much more corporate kind of widget kind of business that they don't really care at all about the brand. They don't really care all about the product. I mean, when I say they don't care, that's not fair, but they don't care about it the same way. Alito Fuente cares. His name is on it. Mm -hmm. It's him. It's a representation of him. It's a representation of his family. Okay. That's a much different scenario than a lot of other brands today. A lot of other brands well they're a brand in a portfolio you know what i mean but they don't really have any connectivity there's no they, they don't have any personal investment into it other than how it performs in the marketplace that's it much different well said well stated hey aaron i'm looking at uh do we want to move eight and nine to the deliberation your call. Yeah, let's move it to the deliberations because we covered some of the deliberation stuff, I think, already. Okay, sounds good. Uh, okay, so Steve, uh, a few short things we're going to do here. I want to do our, our cattle baron steak question of the night. Uh, okay. Since we know you're doing red meat lovers and you're doing all these things, I want to know your favorite cut of steak, and I want to know how you like it cooked. Um, I like ribeyes, and I like them, uh, and I like them typically just a touch under medium. So somewhere between medium rare and medium. Mm -hmm. So what'll normally end up happening is it depends on the restaurant. I'll either order medium or I'll order medium rare just based on how they tend to cook it at that one place. Right. Um, but that, that's kind of where I like it. Um, you know, another cut that I really enjoy is I really like those Denver steak cuts. I don't know if you've had a Denver steak. Mm -hmm. I have not. I'm Google, familiar with it. Yeah, Google that. De the Denver cut is a, a really interesting I tend to like those fattier kind of cuts. Um, I'm not a big fan of like New York strip. I'm not a big fan of uh, fillets. Um, so I mean, ribeye mm. for me, you know, porterhouse number two. You know what I mean? Those are those are kind of where I'm at. Um, I'm okay with the bone on or the bone off. I, I don't care. The only problem I have with the bone on is if I'm cooking it, I don't want the bone on because I'm not good enough to get it right. So for me to eat like a cowboy style steak, I'd much rather order that at a restaurant than I have to pay some for it because they just they're just better at getting the temperature close to the bone right than I am on my grill at home. Um, but yeah, I've, I've always been a, I've always like I, I like look at me I like the fat. You know? So for me for me ribeyes are the best. Yeah. And oddly enough too, I don't like the grass fed as much. Okay. I like, I like, look, it can be grass fed, but I like it to be corn finished at least. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the other thing too is, uh, I can take or leave dry age. I'm, you, can, you know, yeah. to me, dry age, yeah, sometimes I'm in the mood for the dry age, but most times no. Nah. So I'm pretty simplistic corn fed ribeye. Nice. There you go. I, I just looked up the Denver cut. It's, it's that thick chuck. I know what you're talking about now. It's that thick chuck. It's got the marbling in it. Yeah, I know. It, it's yeah. Kind of, basically, what it is is it's a, it's one of those things where it comes from the area of the cow that they can't make a lot of money on it, mm -hmm. but there's one particular part that is really delicious. Yeah. So some of the butchers realize this, and they're now cutting that out. And look, it's all in the marketing, right? Sure. You can't call it. Well, this is the cheap cut that tastes <laughs> good. So they they brand it as Denver cut. Okay? Right. Um, but it's really, it's a really tasty steak. And the thing that's nice about a Denver cut because of, you know, they typically end up being about an inch, an inch and a half thick. Yep. But very rarely are they wider than two to three inches. Yeah. So they're like a super quick on the grill, three minutes aside and you pull them off. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. And they're, they're perfect. But it's, it's a really juicy cut. I really like that Denver cut. Nice. nice. That, that looks good. It's great tacos too. 
Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. All right. Let's get into what we're smoking tonight. We'll kind of just go through this quick uh, so we can get to some of the other things. Um, and it's brought to you by Tailored Smoke, located in the heart of downtown Charlotte's Epicenter. And now just outside the Charlotte Motor Speedway in Concord, North Carolina, Tailored Smoke's your one-stop shop for a smoking experience. Aaron, what did you light up tonight? Uh, I am smoking the original uh, Sobra Mesa in the uh, El Americano Vitola, which is still my favorite cigar that Steve makes. Um, nice wood, uh, peppered steak, uh, cinnamon, uh, some light creaminess in the early stages of it. Um, but that kind of pep has like that nice kind of peppery finish from that peppered steak component that's in there. Um, medium strength it's not like it's not a butt kicker or anything like that um very smooth retro hail um just all around it just hits kind of the it's a, a, what i consider well-rounded because it's got you know it's got that kind of peppery steak part that's like kind of more your savory type stuff uh, but it's got a little bit of that cinnamon in there it kind of gives you a little bit of kind of sweetness to it so it's like it just kind of hits you know a lot of the components that i'm looking for in a cigar that just fills out the kind of the flavor very wheel very for that elegant. Yes, I have. I like the Elegante better, personally. Okay, okay. Yeah, but this is the fantastic cigar. I put it in my uh, in my uh, Battle of the Bands five pack. Um, so, I don't know, are you talking about the one that you put in your five pack? Well, oh, you, I knew you could do that. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, everyone thinks that I like purposely left Steve out, right? I, I I put this criteria together, right? I knew people were gonna pick Steve, but it wasn't like, oh, I'm gonna do this so I can exclude Steve. And everyone like is thinking I did. Of course, I lost, right? So, but all right, I gotta ask Steve. I was stunned. What I was in like, how many packs were there? Five? There were six packs. You were yeah, five of six. Five of the six, and I yeah. I had no clue. We, I mean, I, I had nothing to do with it. The only one I knew I was gonna be in was Kevin's. Mm -hmm. because kevin called me in advance to talk to me about his pack and what i what i told him was that he should go with smaller formats because it would help keep his price down on his mm -hmm. pack and that also it would give him a differentiation from the other packs because look everybody was going to choose five great cigars to be in their packs right mm -hmm. i don't think there were any bad packs right there was no losers anyway no there weren't i mean yeah there's cigars you like better cigars you like less but the truth was all the battle of the band samplers they were all really nice selections yeah. of cigars yeah so i was just and look i would have given the same advice to whoever called me it's just kevin called me and we were talking about it. i said look Kevin, this is what i would do because you're gonna lose to dojo and you're gonna lose to brian glenn at cigar yeah. obsession because they just have so many more followers yeah. that there's just no chance in hell of you winning this thing. So I said, the best thing in my opinion is do something different. And I said, one of the easiest things to do is, you know, you could go all Maduros or you could go all torpedoes, but I said, I would go with all smaller sizes because a lot of cigar geeks like smaller sizes. And I also said, it'll help to keep your price point down. Mm. You'll end up being the cheapest pack most likely if you go with a smaller format. Yeah, and I'm surprised he pulled it off in the end, though. He yeah. he, he did, he did, and and uh, he did. There's no doubt about it. Um, he's I I think he was more of a contender than he was letting people on to be, though. He because he did he did market the hell out of that thing. So yeah, it's not like he didn't he he worked he worked. It's not like he didn't work either. Um, oh yeah, no, no. yeah. Kevin no, he, look, Kevin wasn't look. Eric a cigar. I don't know what he did in the dojo verse because I don't see it. I mean, I don't, I don't think the cigar dojos even mentioned they were in the battle of bands, did they? <laughs> no, they did. They were, they were giving stuff away too. The problem that Eric had is he had two dojo releases in the middle of this whole thing. Uh, uh, well, actually, no, he had one dojo release, and then he was doing that thing out at the Rocky Mountain when it started. So he had a lot of cycles being devoted to that, and and I think that hurt him in the end. Had he not had those distractions, I think it, he might have won it. That's not taking anything away from Kevin, but that was the reality is when Eric was promoting the Rocky Mountain thing, he was he was focused on that. Then he kind of went to Battle of the Bands, and then he had that dojo release that came out um, towards the end. So I think that had a lot to do with it. Um, but it was a lot of fun. I was telling folks, it was the most unique. There's not been a project like that that I can think of in any sort of a retail market where media people were asked to develop. I told the it was yeah. freaking genius when yeah. it came up. 
It mean, was. It was. I, like I said, I would have never thought that five of the six, and I, of course, I have to be the guy. So, uh, <laughs> but but it is what it is. Um, I couldn't. If I'm in it next time, maybe I do. I take the opposite criteria. I do brands, you know, different types of brands, newer brands, uh, five years and under or something. So Steve was just wasn't born in a basket of tobacco. That's what you didn't meet your criteria. So I, yeah, it wasn't like I deliberately said I'm gonna exclude Steve <laughs> because like you know. <laughs> It's just be a hard ass. No, it wasn't. Look, that. you could only pick what five cigars. Oh, and, like, oh, and let me tell you, that I, I, we got more complaints. I was, I was surprised I ended up in so many of them. Listen, I'm gonna I mean, be. I'm gonna. Yeah, I mean, it is, and it was. Uh, you know, believe me, I took a lot of grief from your fans. <laughs> I can tell you that they weren't happy. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Really. Oh, but I took grief from manufacturers. The, the grief from the manufacturers I expected, though, too. Um, so. Well, that, that's always the problem. That's, yeah. Is anyone ever happy? No. No, they're not. Is anyone, oh, he only has two hands. Yeah. Is anyone ever happy with the reviews they get? Is anyone ever happy with the way you talk about their products? I mean, you guys say stuff all the time, and people forward it to me, and they text it to me. And oh, they love doing that. We I'm say anything. To, they yeah, they, they, I'm supposed to get my panties in a bunch about yeah like everything that they love says. doing that. I mean, it's it's just kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. And, and I and I I don't really I don't really understand it, but it's kind of the way it is. But I guess did I see something that he's going to do that again? The Battle of the Bands. Mm-hmm. He's gonna do it early next year, I think. Like a day or two ago, some mention of it. Yeah, I don't know how he's gonna do it. People are asking me if I'm gonna be in it. I mean, if he asks me, I'll be in it. Um, but I don't. He may be going a different angle with this this time too. So yeah, I, I think he'll probably do a different group of people. I, I think he should give another some other people a chance, and then let Kevin have a chance to defend yeah. it. I think like I'd like to see Kevin defend it the second time around. Kind of like my meatball thing, right? I, I get stuck doing it every year until yep. somebody. Please beat me this year. So yeah. oh, oh, so so Steve, <laughs> let me tell you about that. We had Carney on the show, right? And on and this is before yeah. Dave announced the meatball competition. And I said, why don't you get in on the next meatball competition and challenge Saka? And Carney like did this like poker face to try to deny it. And then after the show, he's like, How did you know that? That he was gonna do, that I'm gonna be in it. It's supposed to be a secret. I said, I didn't know. I said, I just guessed it. I said it would have been a perfect Dave Garofalo segue. To put you because of the whole thing going on with the sober Mesa Brulees, you know, Carney's a meat guy as well. I mean, so it was oh, just yeah. a natural thing. I Carney's, thought of. it wasn't Carney's like I a, went, yeah, Carney's a legit cook. yeah, I mean, let's let's not kid ourselves. If we're talking about you have a choice of eating Carney's food or my food, right. you want to eat Carney's food, okay? So let, let's be blunt yeah. now. Did I happen to make a better meatball? Maybe. I mean, I think I won the last time by like one or two votes, it wasn't like the first year. First year was a landslide. The second year, I only eked it out by like one or two votes, but I did a totally different recipe year two. I'm I'm going back and tweaking my year one recipe this year, mm. or maybe I won't, because the truth is, it's a pain. Just get, get out of it. <laughs> just get just buy some frozen meatballs. Just warm them up. <laughs> You're stolen. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe that is because the truth is, it's look, it's fun, but at the same time. It is a little bit of work, you know. Yeah. But if you enjoy cooking, yeah. Like Carney loves to cook. Right. Me, I love to eat. Right. I, I want nothing to do with the cooking in any way whatsoever. <laughs> you know what I mean? So for me to have to defend my title for a third year, it's but then the competitive nature of me, it makes me want to win too. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. It, I like I'm caught, man. I don't know what I want. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, so Steve, a couple yeah. more shorter okay. segments. Yeah, you got you're okay. How are you sure. doing time wise? A couple more shorter segments. Okay. I'm okay. Even though I'm skipping your ad, I gotta read a few more. So <laughs> All That's right. Good. All right. Want to mention Jerry Tobacco. The authentic Coro leaf is one of the most robust and flavorful leaves out there. During the golden age of cigars of Cuba, it was a leaf of choice to make some of the world's greatest cigars. 
Because it was one of the most challenging ones to cultivate, it fell out of favor by the 1990s. In the Hamasran Valley of Honduras, Julio Aroa took on the challenge of growing Corolla from the original seeds, and in 2000, he successfully reintroduced Corolla back to the market. With over 50 years' experience in the tobacco business, from growing and curing tobacco to scar production, the JRE Tobacco Farm has been able to continue to deliver products to market with authentic Corolla. Now, JRE Tobacco brings to you the Aladino line. Aladino is available in a 100% authentic Corolla Puro, San Andreas Maduro, Ecuadorian Connecticut Shade, Habano, or Cameroon Wrapper representing the golden age of scars from 1947 to 1961. Now available at local retailers, be sure to ask for Jerry Tobacco, a legacy that's tasted in every drawer. And by Toscano cigars, as rustic and strong as the people who smoke them, try the Toscano's rustic and full body flavors and aromas. Made in Italy with 100% dark fire cured tobacco from the United States and Italy, is one of the best selling cigars in the world. Toscano cigars are the perfect combination of American and Italian craftsmanship, whether in the traditional long format or the short format Toscanello. Toscano cigars are dry cured, handmade, and fire cured for your enjoyment anytime, anywhere. Visit your local premium cigar retail and look for Toscano cigars today. And by AJ Fernandez cigars. AJ Fernandez's New World brand is named in the honor of the discovery of tobacco by Christopher Columbus's expedition in 1492. Fernandez collaborated with his father, Ishmael, on the cigar, which comprised of a wrapper from Nicaragua that covers binder from the Jalapa Valley and a filler blend of Ometepe, Condega, and Esteli tobaccos. The core line then debuted in 2014, and it was followed by New World Connecticut, New World Puro Special, and New World Cameroon. All four blends are meant to captivate the palate of any cigar smoker. If you're beginning to discover the fine world of premium handmade cigars, New World Connecticut's for you. If you're into the rich full-body blends, Puro Specials for you. If you're into complex flavors, the New World Cameroon's for you. And if you're into the robust and earthy flavors with notes of espresso, the New World Oscuro is definitely for you. Visit www.ajfcigars.com to learn more. And by Mbombay Cigars. Mbombay Cigars represent the most admired cigar culture of Cuba. They select the best of the best quality tobacco to use in the aging process. Mbombay Cigars are enrolled in Costa Rica by some of the world's most experienced cigar rolls, giving it a unique smoking experience. The band portrays the detailed and artistic nature of our small industry. Try M. Bombay, M. Cuba, Gaia, and the MS Lee line. M. Bombay Cigars, where the cigar is a way of life. And uh, we're going to get into uh, our Alec Bradley segment. I want to mention Alec Bradley. Alec Bradley is a family company. Alan Rubin named the company after his two sons, Alec and Bradley, when they were just little tykes. Now they're all grown up, working alongside their dad, making the best damn cigars you ever smoked. Join the family. Try one today. Learn more at alecbradley.com. So this is our uh, Alec Bradley Live True segment, Steve, where we're going to take a little break from some of the cigar talk, which we already did. Um, okay. And I want to talk about your love of fishing. Um, you're, I okay. saw, I've seen your fishing pictures all summer. I know uh, my buddy Stace was up there with you, um, and he had a great time up there. Um, how well, long- weather, man. We worked it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's been really, he's been really getting into the fishing lately. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so, I mean, he's been pretty excited about that. But, Steve, how did you get started with fishing? How long have you been fishing for? Um, I started with my dad. My dad was always a, an avid fisherman. So, you know, you kind of, one of those things that, I mean, from pretty much the age that I was old enough to hold a rod, I started fishing. And then, you know, as my dad, you know, my dad bought a really crappy uh, John boat and then he, built his own fiberglass seats in it and all of that and you know it was kind of a hillbilly special and then uh, you know and then you know he ended up buying his first like aluminum bass tracker i remember what a big step up that one kind of went from there and uh you know i grew up in deep east texas and you know bass fishing is a, a really big deal in deep east texas and you know we used to go up to toledo Bend and you know lake conroe lake livingston sam rayburn and uh we'd fish and it was just part of my childhood so it's the only it's something that uh i just have never lost my love for it's it's just a it's it's a way for me to be outside but still sit on my fat ass <laughs> and uh and i like and i'm and I, you know I, i've had some amazing trips where i've had like just stunning results and i've had a lot of others where you know it was definitely fishing and not catching right. but i but i enjoy it either way because you're outside you know you're, 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 you know, you're i like the solitude of it you know a lot of people they like to fish with a lot of people i i tend to i'm okay with just fishing by myself mm-hmm. I, like, I like the i like the quiet of it i like the simplicity of it i like the hey you know heck Fish aren't biting. I smoke more cigars. Yep. You know what I mean? It's okay. Sometimes when I'm by myself, 
I'll just uh, I'll sit down for 30 minutes and smoke a cigar and not do anything but just sit on the lake and stare at stuff, you know, and then I'll start fishing. But I've uh, I'm um, I'm I'm pretty good at it, you know. Uh, but I mean, I'm good at it just just to, because of so much time, you know. I've spent a lot of time fishing over the years. I, I wish it was. Uh, it's one of the downsides of living in New Hampshire. Is we have such a short season mm-hmm. um that's the one thing that's problematic the flip side of that is we have arguably some of the prettiest lakes in the country mm-hmm. you know i think that uh you know new hampshire maine you know it's very much like minnesota or the upper part of michigan you know so uh i i, I just enjoy it a lot are you are you more of a uh, freshwater fish or deep sea fish? Yeah, definitely think? more fresh. I don't. I don't like. I don't like offshore deep sea fishing at all. I mean, it's a good thing to go out and hang out for the day, but I don't like it where the mate does all the work. You basically are waiting around for a sailfish to get on, and you then you just spend forty five minutes or longer, <laughs> you know, just fighting and reeling. I, I like light tackle. I like you know. I for me the volume of fish is not important. I I catch and release pretty much everything. You know what I mean? It's very rare that I keep any fish at all these days. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, Yeah, no, no. I, I, I haven't kept, I think last year I kept enough fish for one fish fry. Hmm. You know what I mean? This year I didn't keep a single fish. Wow. You know, I, uh, yeah, no, I, you know, now, the other thing, saltwater, the thing that I got into when I was living in South Florida is I got into that inshore fishing mm-hmm. where it's, you know, it's saltwater, but it's close right. to shore or it's back in the mangroves and Florida was perfect for that. Mm-hmm. You know, and you're targeting species like, you know, sea trout and snook and mangrove snappers and, you know, things like that. Uh, you know, redfish, I like redfish a lot. But again, like tarpon, I know everybody wants that 150, 200 pound big silver king. I, I've done that fishing and I've caught some big tarpon, but honestly, tarpon I like the best are the 15, 20 pounders. They're, you know, young. They're laid up in that brackish water back in the mangroves. And, you know, you're flipping a, you're flipping some sort of soft plastic right up underneath and you're trying to get them to come out and you're, you know, you're fishing them with, you know, anywhere from you know 15 8 you know 20 pound test kind of line you know where it's you know where it's really sporting and yeah i mean yeah can you catch a lot more snook if you use shrimp yes you're gonna catch way more snook and even with shrimp live shrimp it can be hard snook snook can be pretty cagey but for me it was never a quantity thing it was always a the sporting aspect of it to me is part of the enjoyment of it it's not a now look Someday, if I have grandkids, guess what? We're going to be using live crickets and we're going to go out and we're going <laughs> to yeah. boat a billion crappie. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Catch a ton of yellow perch. Going to keep the kids engaged. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But, you know, but if we're talking about me, I would rather catch nothing and do it that way. Like, even, like, even, so I'm really good with soft plastics. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm really quite good. I mean, I grew up, you know, Texas rigging, Carolina rigging. I mean, I'm really good with Senkos. I've got a really good technique for wacky worming. I'm pretty, I'm pretty good at it, but I never do it because I find it boring. So even though I know I can catch more fish even that way, and even though it is technical, I, I don't like the pace of it. I don't like how slow it is. You know, I, I don't want to have to focus on you know, feeling the line and every little bump and every little touch. And, you know, it's like I fish a lot of, I fish a lot of shallow style, you know, top water, you know, uh, I, I love like jerk baits, you know, I love those vision one tens. It's one of my favorite jerk baits. You know, once I, I tend to fish mostly 12 up is where most of my fishing occurs. Because that's what I personally enjoy. You know what I mean? Even though I know that in the dead of summer, I'm going to catch much larger smallmouth if I start focusing on structure that's, you know, 
25 to 35 foot down. Okay. I'll catch more fish, but I don't, I don't enjoy that style of fishing as much. So I just don't do it. Now, I guess if I was a tournament fisherman and I was trying to make weight, I would say, okay, this is what I got to do to put more weight in the boat. But for me, I'm catching a fish and I'm letting it go. Mm -hmm. You know, so for me, I don't, uh, I don't really worry about that at all. So what species are, are you going after to kind of where, up where you're at now? More, I, more live, recently? I primarily focus on smallmouth bass. Okay. I mean, we have large mouth. And you know, sometimes, you know, if they, days are really slow and I want some action, I'll target pickerel. Mm-hmm. Okay, we don't have pike in New Hampshire. Um, there's Supposedly there's a pike in a few places, but uh, I, it's not a big, it's not like, you get more pike in Vermont and upstate New York. Okay. Um, so, but we, we have some really good sized chain pickerel, which is right. from the same family. And so like, if I'm having a really slow day, yeah, I'll start going into some of that scrappy water and just start, you know, trying to, you know, buzz bait or anything really flashy, anything really fast. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You know, to try to try to get some, it was the same thing. Even when I was in South Florida, like there's a scrap fish back in like the Everglades called a ladyfish. It's considered a junk garbage fish, but they're a lot of fun to catch. <laughs> when you get into them, you, you'll boat, you'll boat <laughs> literally a fish every cast. Right. Okay. So, you know, look, if I'm having a day and I'm not picking up any reds and I'm not picking up any snooks, I don't have any luck with a micro tarpon. You know, I had a couple of places back there uh, in the Everglades national park that, they're just guaranteed lady fish. Mm-hmm. I'd go in there for an hour and a half and I would catch 30 fish and I'd <laughs> get it out of my system and they're then really... I'd go back to focusing on real fish. Yeah. Because you know, they're, they're really aggressive. Mm-hmm. They strike, they strike, they strike aggressive and they're a lot of fun to catch. And again, it always depends on the tackle. Yeah. If you're using light tackle and you're using light line, I mean, they fight incredibly well. Yeah, if you're, I mean, if you're using a rod made for tuna, Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> catching a ladyfish is a waste of time. Yep. But if you're if you're fishing eight pound test on a real light, lively rod, you know, a, a two pound ladyfish is a hell of a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, look, I do more fly. I used to do not more, but I used to fish more fly fishing mm. for trout um, and whatnot. But I don't have that type of time anymore. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I can't, and, look, and, and, you know, trout is very, the river's a certain way, the water's a certain way, the temperature's here, yeah. you know, you've got certain times where you have certain hatches, and if you're not there when the hatch is occurring, you know what I mean? So, yeah. and that just doesn't work with the schedule that we in our industry typically have. Sure. That it's not like, well, I have a nine to five job and I'm home all the time normally, so I can say, oh, well, the trout are running. The mayfly hatch just happened. Yeah. Let's go. You know what I mean? Yeah. For me, I'm always trying to squeeze things in. Yeah. So the only guaranteed fishing I get is that trip every year to Lake Umbagog. Mm-hmm. And the only reason why I even get that is because I pay for it the year before. Mm-hmm. So like the house that stays came and visited me and I, I pay the rental on that the year before okay. because I know when the time comes, I don't have time to go. Right. But I also know that I've already paid for it. Mm. And then I feel like really wasteful. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? So by having paid in advance, it kind of forces me to do it. Yeah. I was just so you, good. I mean, it yeah. forces you to take some time. So that's good. Yeah. I was going to ask, I didn't know if like Umbagog was like, like right near your house or if it's something further away, I, I'm not really sure the geography. So, but that's your, I was going to ask if it's that was your to, regular place. It's about, no, it's for me, it's about a four and a half hour drive with the, is that true? Yeah. Wow. About four and a half hours with the boat. Mm-hmm. Um, you can do it in about three, three fifteen, If you're not trailering the boat, but if you're trailering the boat, it takes, it takes always over four, four and a half hours roughly to get up to, and, and as I've always said before, the proper pronunciation for everybody that lives here, it's Umbagog, but Umbagog. I've said it wrong for years, so I keep saying it wrong. Um, but uh, but the thing that's so nice about that lake, 
is that it's a true wilderness lake. 95% of the shoreline's in conservatory. Mm -hmm. It's part of the wildlife refuge. So there's like nothing on that lake. Right. There's, and I mean, I think Stace was with me and I think there was a whole day we didn't see another boat at all. Oh, nice. wow. That's nice, nice. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it's, and it's not, it's not a small lake. It's like 7,000 square acre lake. Mm -hmm. So it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's 10 to 12 miles from North to South on the lake. Wow. Okay. It's okay. a big lake, but look, it's, it's a little, it's remote. It's a little too far. And because there's no development on the lake, there's no place to really stay. Right. That was my next question. I didn't know if there were hotels so, you know, in the area. People, yeah. No, there's not a, there's not a hotel in the lake. There's nothing. There's literally the house that I rent is actually the only rental I know of on the whole lake. Hmm. There's no other house to even rent. I'm always worried that they're going to decide to stop leasing it. Cause then it's going to suck. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know? I mean, there's a motel in Arrow that you can stay at, but that's like 10 miles away from the lake. Right. That's the whole act of mm. putting the boat in in the morning and taking it out every night. It's, you know, it's one of the reasons why I like it because, you know, where I, where I lease, they have a dock. Mm -hmm. So I put the, wa the boat in the water and then the boat in the water the entire right. week. So, you know, and the other thing too is, and I think this kind of probably drove Stace a little crazy. Because, you know, look, a guy like Stace, he travels all the way up here. He wants to fish 24-7. <laughs> and I'm kind of like, yeah, I want to have my coffee. <laughs> yeah. so there's no reason to freeze my balls off. There's no reason it's pouring. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Kind of like, uh, you know, heck, you know. And so I, I, and I, I don't need to be miserable for the sake of trying to catch a few extra fish. Yeah. Right, right. I tell you, those days with Stace, they were hard days. I think we had one day. It was pouring rain, and it was like forty-five degrees. Oh wow! Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is in August. It was <laughs> brutal. Now I think we managed to catch. We didn't catch a lot of fish, but we caught. We caught. We caught healthy fish. They were. They were substantial sizes. Yeah, he showed but, a picture of one of them. Yeah. Yeah. No, he he, he caught the biggest fish that day. Yeah, he, he caught the biggest because he was with us. I mean, we were together. I mean, but here's the sad part. Like four days later, I had a day that I couldn't stop catching fish. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? I literally, and I think I posted a picture that day. It was like fish number 26 in like an hour. <laughs> it was crazy. Wow. I mean, it was like a, every cast was like a fish. I, like, I did not go three casts without a fish mm -hmm. for like a two and a half hour stretch there. It was insane. You know, but that's fishing, right? Yep. Wow. Uh, you know, it's just uh, it's just kind of the way the way it bounces. But I like the whole activity of fishing. Yep. We uh, had a yeah, we had a question from the chat room. Is there any fishing locale that's on your bucket list to go fish at? Well, there was one, and I had the opportunity to fish it. I wanted to fish the river Spey. I wanted to fly fish in Scotland. Mm -hmm. You're there in Speyside. It's Scotland. It's the river Spey. It's so romantic, the whole thing. But the truth is, it was like it was like five thousand dollars to get a permit as a non-citizen. Wow. To fish two days on the river Spey. Man. So you had to pay 5K to be allowed to fish on the river and you had to hire a guide mm. for those two days. And I think that was going to add like another $3,000. So it's going to be like $8,000. And the river spay is notoriously difficult to catch fish on. Okay. There's like, there's guys that live there that they fish all season, that they land one good salmon. It's like <laughs> their season. So it was going to be like eight G's for me to not catch fish yeah. at all. And I, and I just, so I didn't do it. So I had the opportunity to do it. I was there. I looked into it and I just couldn't do it. Right. Yeah, <laughs> really... All right. So 
it's still on my bucket list, but I was already there and I could have done it, but I didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. It was just too crazy yeah. to spend that kind of money. Find a lot more enjoyment for eight grand, right? Yeah, it's it <laughs> too much. You know what I mean? <laughs> Had it been like three, yeah, I would have done it. And three would have been stupid, mm -hmm. but I would have gone that level of stupid. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I couldn't do eight. It was just, it was just too much. And you know, another place that I've never, that I've always wanted to fish is I've always wanted to fish uh, Rio San Juan in Nicaragua. All these years I've been going there and it has some of the best tarpon fishing in the world. It's notorious for monster tarpon. And uh, the problem is it's not easy to get to, you know, up until just a few years back, there was actually not even a real road to get to. Is that, in the, east, is that in the east part of the country? Yeah, it's in the very southeast. It's on okay. the border. The, the River San Juan is the border between Costa Rica and Nicaragua. Okay. 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 And it empties out into the Atlantic. It comes out of uh, Lake Nicaragua and empties into the Atlantic. And I mean, let's say this the small tarpon are 150 pounds, is what wow. everybody always tells me. Wow. Yeah, they're, they're, it's, it's known for 200 pound plus tarpon in that and um so i mean but the problem always is to say there it's and that's expensive to fish too because uh there's a couple uh there's a couple uh guide services that do it but they're not catering to nicaraguans they're catering to really wealthy fishermen so you're, you're gonna pretty much probably spend about probably about 5k to spend a week fishing on rio san juan um but for me the 5k for a week of fishing again very expensive don't get me wrong i understand but it's not unreasonable anybody that pays for you know a week of guided fishing it's not it's not a it's not a crazy crazy number um the problem is it's just not easy to get to you know there's they have this little plane that runs out of the managua airport out there but i i'm not getting on one of those planes <laughs> well maybe. A, I don't fit and B, people die on little planes. It's yeah. just the way it works. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And if you're going to crash in the Nicaraguan jungle, nobody's coming for your ass. Okay. <laughs> There's no hope in hell that even if you survive, you're dead. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, the only logical way to do it is you fly into San Jose and Costa Rica, and then you can take, uh, you can get shuttled to the river. And then they put you on a river boat that takes you about two or three hours eastward on the river to get to where these sporting lodges are. Wow. That's, but again, so you want to spend a week there. You also got to set aside another week for the travel. Right. You know what I mean? It's just, it's really hard to carve out that kind of time, mm -hmm. you know? So that, that's kind of a bucket list kind of thing. Eventually, I guess I'll get around to it. I think what I'd like to really do, and I always say I'm going to do it, but I never do, is just hook my boat up to the truck and, you know, do some cigar events around the United States and just mm. do some fishing on the on this long extended trip. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Where I just kind of say, hey, you know. I'm going to do less advanced. It's not going to be prop. It's not going to be profit. Whatever right. it is, but. But, you know, maybe, you know, because there's a lot of places that are great to fish in SD and the Carolinas and, you know, Arkansas and tons of places, Texas yeah. and whatnot. Look, there's great places to fish all around the country. So, right. I mean, there's there's no shortage. And the thing that's nice about for me is the way my boat is configured, it's a, uh, it's a bass boat configuration, but it's rigged for salt water. Oh, okay. Oh, good. So it's basically a, it's basically designed as a tournament red fishing boat. Mm. So it's a Ranger Comanche series boat, but with none of the carpeting. Right. You know, it's it's a white fiberglass. It looks like a salt water. It looks like it's it looks like a saltwater boat, but it's a bath boat. Yeah. It's a really odd kind of boat, but it's nice because that means you can, you know, if you're in Jacksonville, you know, you can fish, you know, St. John's River, you know, in the brackish water. It would be perfect mm. down in Miami to go to the Everglades National Park. And you could fish, you know, back up in Shark River and all those areas. Mm -hmm. 
So it's a it's a really versatile boat for those purposes. Yes. Very nice. Eventually I'll do it. Awesome. So um a couple of things. Uh, I didn't mention what I was smoking. I'm smoking the Tricky Chaka 552. I did skip that because we got uh, sidetracked with, with meatballs. Uh, I love this cigar. Uh, the 552 for me is uh, – I love the Tricky Chaka in this size. Um, you know, Steve, one – I just want to mention about the Tricky Chaka. When you came out with Me Corita, you, you talked about being, being kind of a dank cigar, right? Yeah. Is this – to me, this is almost less dank, even though it's more powerful. Is that is that a fair assessment? Or am I just look, it's up? a trade-off. I mean, yeah. look, I yeah. mean, Me Corita is – I think the Me Rita Blue is more of a classic broadleaf. It's, mm-hmm. you know, earthy, yeah. and, you know, uh, deeper, richer kind of style flavors. I think the the chocolate's more pronounced. Yes. I think the coffee notes are more pronounced. Mm-hmm. I think the sweetness is more pronounced. And then the Tricky Traka blend, what you're getting is you're getting more pepper. Mm-hmm. The spice aspect, the Tricky yep. Traka is more pronounced. Yeah. And in making that more pronounced well the chocolate becomes a little more dark chocolatey Mm. the the coffee becomes a little bit more bitter espresso kind of you know so you know it's a bit of a trade-off and it really kind of just depends on what you like to smoke i mean they're both broadleaf cigars they're both definitely related if you smoke them and it's kind of it's look i don't want to draw a direct comparison but it is kind of that same conversation of T52 versus nine. Right. You know what I mean? And I think that depending on what style you like is going to be the determining factor as to which of the two you're going to prefer. But it's really unlikely that somebody would love Tricky Chaka and hate the Mickey Rita Blue right. or vice versa. They're very, they're very good. Yeah. They're, they're, they're there. They're together. They're very similar blends. It's really just, you know, there's an addition of one tobacco in the Tricky Traka. And as a result, the proportions on some of the other fat tobaccos end up being scaled back. But it's really kind of a, it's a flavor variation. So it really just depends as to you, what you personally like. I can tell you right now, I love Tricky Traka. Uh, 648 is my favorite. That was the first cigar I smoked, actually, when we were on the air early. And, uh, but if I had to choose which would I smoke, I smoke more blue than I smoke red. Me personally. Mm-hmm. Um, but I completely understand why someone would like red better than blue. I just, I think it's a question of what you like, you know. I'm actually, I'm actually, the one thing I'm glad, I was really worried this whole election cycle that people are going to start making a deal out of the fact that they were red and blue. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't know. There you go. Um, there you go. The angle you could have done. Like, as it was, we put together an electoral college map by state of which one it is. <laughs> yes. And I was like, oh, I just, because uh, it certainly was no intent on my yeah. part to go that way. No. The sad part is the next one's probably going to be green. So then I guess I'd be the green party, right? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> what, color do I use for, what color do I use for libertarians? I don't even know. Uh, they have color. Well, That's, they have a color. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I don't even know what color represents the Libertarian Party. I have no idea. I have not tried to even ask the question because it will create a debate. <laughs> Somebody in the chat room will know that answer. Gold, yeah. yellow. Gold, yellow? Yeah, that's the Libertarian color. There you go. Really? I didn't know that. There you okay. go, Steve. It's the next one. Well, that makes, you know what? They're probably taking that from the don't tread on me. Yeah, Sorry probably. The Adson flag. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would uh, comes in. Um, but uh, but I think when it comes to when it comes to me, K- I mean, look, blue way out sells red currently, but blue was in the marketplace for three years, so blue has a much bigger built in customer, yeah, uh, babe, than, than the tricky Traka does. Ultimately, I don't know which one sell better. Um, the thing is, too, and I also don't know, does the, and this is another thing I always have to think about, is I always have to wonder, you know, by making me K. Rita Tricky Traka, am I just cannibalizing my me K. Rita sales? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, maybe I am, and maybe just me K. Rita is just growing so much that I don't notice it because my blue numbers haven't gone down because of red. My blue numbers have been growing 
really, really well. And now the red numbers are growing really, really well, you know? So I don't, I don't ultimately know that answer, but I think it really just depends on the consumer, the smoker, what you prefer. And I know for me, I love them both. It just depends on my mood. Yeah, me too. Me too. Uh, I mean, I still love that Gordito you've done in the blue. That's my favorite. Uh, the fantastic size. Yeah, uh, Gordita's, a, Gordita's, one of the, Gordita's one of the standouts. It's a yeah, really, really nice one. Yeah, the good expression of the whole one. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it a lot. All right, one more kind of non-cigar related question. And I'm going to put a prop up for this one. And I got to ask this question because I said I was going to ask it. Okay. The woodchuck. Yes. All right. I'm going to ask the question point blank. Oh, I'll tell you my, my, what I'm going to say. I don't think there was any way you were killing that woodchuck. True or false? false. <laughs> I think you knew the second you put that picture up, you, they were going to save it. Look at, the, look at that cute, cuddly woodchuck. <laughs> Dude, I tried to shoot that woodchuck <laughs> I got one clean shot at it and I blew it. <laughs> if there's any doubt whether I would kill the woodchuck, I'm sure if you search the internet, you will find a picture of me four years earlier <laughs> holding a woodchuck only three times that size dead with the gun. <laughs> Look yeah, at I was, I, yeah, I was going to kill the woodchuck. Of course, it's a rodent. The whole, the whole woodchuck conversation. You know what's funny? In that whole conversation... It turns out if I had lived in Pennsylvania or New Jersey or Massachusetts, you're not even allowed to release a woodchuck. You have to kill it. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah, they have state, they have state laws against it. You're not allowed to, because it's basically like, oh, let me relocate this really big rat to somebody else's property. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, I caught this alligator. Let me move it over to my neighbor's <laughs> place. You know, it's actually illegal in a lot of states. And it didn't turn out to be illegal in New Hampshire. But uh, yeah, I, I had no intention on calling the uh, uh, the the, uh, the wildlife trapping people to you know I basically called a, I called an independent pest control, you know, wildlife control uh, to to end up taking the woodchuck. And honestly, I don't even know she didn't kill the damn woodchuck. Yeah, <laughs> I paid my money. She said she was gonna release it. She loaded it in the back of her Subaru, but it ain't like I got pictures and video of the woodchuck scampering free into the off into the horizon. So all I know, the woman drove, uh, she drove a mile away and she plugged the little sucker. I have no clue. <laughs> it's probably a woodchuck shooty gallery somewhere and they just, she just picks them up and drops them off there for a nice a double fee. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This woodchuck. It, the thing about the whole winter, it doesn't bother me that people like, look, I understand people feel like, oh, uh, why are you killing the woodchuck? The woodchuck's just doing what woodchucks do. I get all of that. I had no issue with any of that. My issue was when I started getting the ones that, I mean, when the one woman was comparing me to like being a Nazi for killing a woodchuck, <laughs> yeah. that's where it's just like, okay. We're just in the realm of just absolute stupidity here. Okay. And, and, and that's what lit me up about the damn woodchuck. Now, in the end, it turned out good. Um, in fact, I'm glad you reminded me about this because I still haven't donated the GoFundMe money uh, to the animal shelter. There seems to be some problem. They never forwarded me all the money. And in fact, Cindy even asked me about that. I need to, I need to check into that tomorrow. So I get that check cut to the to the to the, the to the people for the for all the donations out of the GoFundMe, but yeah, it turned out to be good because I mean in the end, maybe the woodchuck lived happily after after I don't know, uh, but heck, the animal shelter it's gonna get a nice check. I think it was like what, fifteen hundred, seventeen hundred. Yeah. I can't even remember the number. I thought it was sixteen. Yeah. And it was right around that. Yeah. You know, the, but you, now, now you got me thinking. But you could have blasted that thing before putting the picture up. If you really wanted to kill it, right? Couldn't you just like blast it and have been done with it? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> look, was it one of my better? Have I now learned my lessons about what I should share on social media? <laughs> um, but I, I, I don't. It wasn't like there was some giant public outcry to save the woodchuck, right? Okay, and when I put the GoFundMe up, that's what I wasn't I putting it up to save the woodchuck i was putting it up to let those eight people or so that dm me say hey 
you know what? You want the woodchuck alive? It costs two seventy five. <laughs> you know, that's what the woman quotes me to go save the woodchuck. Donate enough money to cover the woodchuck, and I'll make it even better. It really isn't about the two hundred seventy five bucks. You donate two seventy five. I'm going to donate to a no kill shelter the same amount of money. So yeah. it wasn't about the money. It was about the whole principle and right. the nonsense. And all. you did match. And you did match a portion of this. In fairness, too. I mean, which I thought I was going to match it from jump. Right. That was the deal. So it was like it wasn't like I was trying to melt people for two hundred seventy five dollars. No, I didn't. I don't what think it was that's is, a- I just think it's silly. So, so the thing that in the end, none of those people that private messaged me to give me grief about saving the woodchuck, not a single one of them contributed even five dollars towards the life of the woodchuck. Unbelievable. But yet, but yet they had the they had the they felt as though they could berate me. <laughs> I mean, you called me a Nazi for God's sake. Oh I mean, really? <laughs> you can you can do that, but you can't kick up five bucks for the woodchuck. <laughs> do you really care? I mean, that was kind of it. And honestly, and then a few people donated to it as kind of a you know, just kind of goofy. And then I threw a prize in there and I figured, you know what? Let's make this into something good. Right. And I figure, you know what? I'll offer a, a raffle prize. Let's see how much we can raise. And I could have, look, I could have raised way more. I mean, because I basically told people you don't get multiple entries for high donations. A $5 donation is as good as a $50 donation. You know, I I, I could, I probably could have easily drove that up to be 10,000 bucks. Yeah. Because I think the, I think, I don't, I didn't like, there's no way for me to add up what the person got. But I think, I think, I think Janine Bradford, right? She was the winner. I don't remember who won. There was like legitimately, there was like legitimately over a thousand dollars worth of cigars. It just cost numbers. And I mean, there was like original release of Feral Flying Pigs. There was an original first box of Dirty Rats. There was, you know, there was unicorns. There was all sorts of like really great stuff in there. You know what I mean? There was a lot of stuff in there that you just couldn't buy no matter how much money you had. So it was it was like a legitimately probably a two thousand dollar plus prize, and uh, so, but yeah. And the woodchuck problem solved. You don't you don't have any more woodchucks on the property. You 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 kind no, of. No, I'm gonna have I'm gonna still have a problem because what's gonna happen is every year something moves in under that outbuilding. <laughs> it's uh you know last year was the first year we didn't, but it's always skunks. Oh. Uh. This was, this was the second this was the second woodchuck in the last 10 years what i need to do is i need to go and dig a trench around the whole building and i need to put in i need to put in some sort of uh some screw or screening or mesh or something to prevent them from tunneling under the building the problem that i have is it's not sitting on just ground soil it's sitting on a, a hard pack uh, gravel driveway oh yeah so in order for me to dig that trench, it's going to require me to hook the backhoe to the tractor and because there's no way I'm breaking that ground with a shovel and a pick, yeah. not at my age, not at my health, because it would be miserable as a 19-year-old guy to do the work. <laughs> and uh, so it, it, there's no easy fix to prevent this, but I'm going to have to do something because it seems like almost every year we end up with some sort of nuisance wildlife. I mean, one year we had, uh, no, it's only been skunks. Of wood. I was going to say a possum. That's not true. It's always been skunks or woodchucks. Mm-hmm. Two times we've had woodchucks and all the other times have been skunks. So out of the last 10 years, I think we've had something seven years out of the 10 end up living under that building. Oh, wow. Yeah, it, it's a problem. All right. And I'm going to have to fix it. I don't, I don't know. It's just... <laughs> Yeah, I tried to shoot that sucker. I don't even know how I missed it, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, now, the skunks are another story. You, you're going to shoot those, right? You're not going to, like, capture a skunk and do a go for I, I can't see that one. There's no better. Um, actually, the skunks, I have, the skunks I've captured and released. Oh, really? Yeah, skunks aren't, skunks aren't as destructive as woodchucks. Woodchucks are very destructive. That's the thing. I don't think people... People don't realize how destructive woodchucks are. Uh, woodchucks are woodchucks ruin foundations. Woodchucks eat 
electrical wires, woodchucks. Yeah, woodchucks are woodchucks are problematic. Um, you know, the skunks, the skunks, the skunks are skunks are much easier to relocate. And the other thing with a woodchuck, and anybody will tell you that's released a woodchuck out of one of these have a heart traps, that little bastard, you got a good shot of him turning around and trying to bite your ass. Oh yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So they'll go after Yeah, you. no, they're yeah, they're not they're not the that whole cuddly image. <laughs> that's a that is not the way woodchucks act. <laughs> this thing doesn't look mean at all. He looks happy. I mean, <laughs> yeah. always been a picture. And yeah. everything. Tell you, what, you look at that photo. You saw that photo on the screen. Look at those claws on that front foot on the right hand side. You can see them right in there. You see those claws? Yeah, yeah. Those, and those are those aren't even extended. No, that that those woodchucks are mean. You know? <laughs> uh, all right. So that was woodchuck gate. Uh for here um let's do we'll do one more round of uh sponsors without steve's and then we'll do the final segment here um and i want to mention la aurora cigars in the heart of santiago dominican republic on the rolling floor at the la aurora cigar factory is a section reserved only for the elite the best of the best these elite cigars will work for over 10 years to simply get an opportunity to make a historic cigar those cigars are la aurora preferidos six featuring six different wrappers and a beautifully packaged perfecto shape la aurora preferidos have been the preferred cigar of the leon family for 117 years take part in a legendary tradition that started the dominican cigar industry look to the lion la aurora cigars we are dominican defined and by J.C. Newman Cigar Company. Founded in 1895 by Julius Caesar Newman, the J.C. Newman Cigar Company is the oldest family-owned premium cigar maker in America. For four generations and over 125 years, J.C. Newman has been handcrafting many of the world's finest cigars. J.C. Newman is headquartered in an iconic 110-year-old-plus cigar factory in the Ybor City National Historic Landmark District in Tampa, Florida. At this factory known as Elder Hole, J.C. Newman rolls premium cigars by hand and hand-operated antique machines. The J.C. Newman Pensa Factory is the second largest in Nicaragua, and it's where Brickhouse, Pilar del Mar, El Baton, Quorum, and Yagua cigars are hand-rolled. J.C. Newman's Diamond Crown, Maximus, Julius Caesar, and Black Diamond cigars are handmade by Tobacco Lara A. Fuente in the Dominican Republic. With its longtime partners, the Arturo Fuente family, the Newmans have founded the Cigar Family Charitable Foundation, which supports low-income families in the Dominican Republic with education, health care, vocational training, and clean water. Visit jcnewman.com to learn more. And by Casa Cuevas Cigars. The Cuevas family has five generations of experience in cigar making. For many years, they have manufactured cigars for many industry leaders out of that Las Lavas factory in the Dominican Republic. Now the Cuevas family has brought their very own brand to market with Casa Cuevas Cigars. Try the Casa Cuevas Connecticut, the Casa Cuevas Habano, Casa Cuevas Maduro, La Mandaria, and the Cuevas Reserva line. If they don't carry it, be sure to ask your local retailer for Casa Cuevas Cigars. Casa Cueva Cigars, from our casa to yours. And finally, by Aventura Cigars. Aventura the Explorer is the first creation by Marcel Noble and Henderson Ventura. Immediately after lighting up the Explorer, the Mexican rapper will delight the aficionado with dark chocolate flavor. After a while and pleasure, the Dominican filler will flatter the aficionado's palate with wonderful spicy and leathery aromas and unite it with the wooden sweetness of Ecuador. Try Aventura the Explorer and explore the wonderful experience. So um, we're going to get into our deliberation segment. And I think, Aaron, uh, this is more of an industry topic thing I think we're going to have tonight. Yep. Aaron, um, I'm going to turn this one over to you for number eight. I think you had some good stuff in here uh, on, the, on 2021. Okay. Uh, so, Steve, you talked on a little bit about some of these items, but I wanted you to kind of look into your crystal ball for 2021 and maybe a little bit beyond that. Um, and thinking of like how 2020 has kind of transpired in regards to um, – you know, lockdowns and things of that nature. Um, do you see any effect on tobacco quality uh, for 2021 or maybe it's going to actually show up in 2022, 23 or whatever in regards to were the farms or the processing, was that hit at all by these kind of lockdowns and things like that? Not really. I mean, look, most of the people that do the real work, they live there. So, right. so for the most part, I don't think that, that that's going to be really much of an issue. Okay. Um, then I want to talk about quantity of releases and you kind of already touched on what you're, you know, you're looking at for next year. You're going to make sure you're sure you're down there January to kind of get the, get things lined up for the year. But, um, and you also said that you see a lot of releases coming out for the industry. I don't see, uh, I'm speculating. I just, given the way that the substantial equivalency right down, I mean, look, we're not, we're not out of the woods on this topic at all. Sure. Basically what we got is we got a stay of execution is what we got. Right. 
but nothing nothing has actually really changed. The question is, will the FDA bring it back up again? Mm -hmm. I don't know that, honestly, I think they're kind of happy the courts kind of saved them from this. Um, but look, if you release something new, it's not, it's not, it's not protected. You don't even really have a shot. It's, it's not going to fit in the same category as those pre August 8th, 2016s. Right. Okay. So the pathway to getting them to stay in the marketplace may prove to be harder. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you're taking a little bit of a risk there, but since most companies release stuff that they don't really think they'll be selling two years from now, anyways, that won't affect their decision on that. Um, I think that, uh, I think we're just going to see a lot of new products. I, I just, it's the vibe, I guess the feeling, because I mean, we've had a lot less over the last couple of years. And I think that you're going to see, I think you're going to see a lot of people do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So, but that's just a general feel. I'm not, I'm not hearing about people doing a lot of stuff, but sure. I really know but you guys talk to way more cigar people than I talk to. Mm -hmm. So you guys have a better idea, but just knowing the way our industry thinks and the, what, what's happened in the past, I'm expecting there to be a boatload of new stuff next year. Now, will it be, will it be good? Or that was the next we'll question see. is what do you think the quality of the cigars will be in 2021? I think it'll be the same as it is now. Okay. Again, I think for a lot of, again, it's, but I don't want to put names on these things because right. that's not fair, but there's a lot of people that really, they're not all that integral to the process. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think that there's going to be a quality difference. Um, I just think that it's just going to be, I think, I think consumers are going to get hit with a lot right. next year. And look, we only have so many dollars in our wallets and you, we all want to try the new, new, new. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's going to make it really hard for, you know, it'll make it potentially hard for, you know, me and sober Mesa, make it harder for me and me, K Rita. You know what I mean? Right. This year was such a weird year that uh, it's not the same. It's hard. It's really hard to base anything on this year. Right. So, I mean, but, I, I do think we'll see an awful lot of releases. I will say this, and I'm sure you guys, I'm going to put words in your mouth and you can tell me whether you think I'm correct in this okay. assessment. Okay. The longer you do this, the more you realize that you get less and less excited by the new stuff. Yeah. I because think there really uh, isn't that... You get to a point where it's kind of like it doesn't excite you. It isn't that new. It isn't really that fresh. Yeah, it has a new name and yeah, it has a new story, but there's only so many ways a cigar can be put together. Mm -hmm. There's only so many flavor profiles that you can you can hit with a cigar. Right. You know what I mean? So you don't find yourself whereas 10 years ago, you would try something and you go, wow, that's amazing. It's one of the best cigars I ever had. Wow, this is a game changer. And the more you get into it, you start to realize that, no, nah, not so quick. Right. That, that happened. It, yeah. It's just something that happens over time. Yeah. I could tell you that's happened with me. And like a lot, a lot of single store releases have fallen into that category, a lot of limited editions. Where now I'm finding myself getting more excited about core lines and core line sustainability. So that's kind of, like I said, I've seen that happen with the limited market, and, and I think that's kind of played out a lot. Um, yeah, you can get some cool sizes, maybe some one-off blends, but but the most part, I've been I've been it's been a lot less interesting to me be, be, um, as a result of that. And I'm, I, I get more interested in a core line and, and seeing how that's going to develop and grow over a five-year period. That's that's me now. Well, um, you know, one of the one of the curiosities I have is for like um, you more U.S. based brands where, you know, wh whoever it is, is that's, you know, whether it's a brand owner that, you know, uses a factory, in, you know, Nicaragua, Dominican, whatever it is, um, where they don't have the time to travel down there or the ability to travel down there because of what's going on. 
you know, does that affect what they can produce for next year? Um, and, you know, if they're doing kind of more mailing back and forth of trying to create something, um, are they going to be able to get the same level that they've done in the past where they may have been able to go down there to be more hands-on with it? Uh, so I'm just kind of curious to see maybe how that shakes out over the next year or so. Yeah, but what you guys don't see is, I mean, there are so many brands that I see you guys get excited about that I know the bands were done long before the product was ever yep. even. Yeah, I think it's fair. The, 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 the manufacturer is literally slapping something together in the four weeks before the trade show. Mm -hmm. So they have something to show at the trade show. Right. We've, you know we've been I mean? told that we've been told that by some manufacturers that they've been forthright the about thing that is, you know, there's no upside for me to say that's the case with a and that's the case with B and that's the case with C because it's just very sour grape -ish, and it's very petty. And in the end, it ultimately doesn't matter because maybe thing they slap together in the four weeks prior to the trade show turns out to be a great cigar and a wonderful seller. You know what I mean? So, but I think that the, there are some products that people put a lot of time and effort into, and there's other products that they don't. And yeah. typically what ends up happening in the long run is time tends to sort those out. Okay. And that's one of the reasons why I always say to people, go look at the top 10 list from seven years ago. How many of those brands are really actively selling on the shelf today? Are people still talking about how great that cigar is? Okay. People still talk glowingly about an Arturo Fuente 858. Yep. Even to this day, Padron 1926 is still held in high regard, even though it came out, what, 98, 99-ish? The 64 was like in what, 95 roughly? Yeah. You know what I mean? So the question is, do these, because the only way for a product to withstand the test of time is because it's good enough that it's found a really loyal customer base for it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there, there's definitely, there's definitely a difference there. And anybody can make something that tastes good in a bubble. Yeah. I mean, the question is, can you make it long-term? Can you make it consistent? Can you make it sustainably? Right. That gets lost in the media world mm -hmm. because look, uh, people want to read about the new people. Look, I go to a cigar store and I say, Hey, what do you got? That's new. I'm doing the same thing. I'm not, I'm not above it. Right. right. I want to try the new stuff. I want to try what's interesting. What's fresh. I, I think it's just human nature, but in the end, that is really what kind of separates the wheat from the chaff. Yeah. And that's actually where in our business, you end up making some money, you know, as when you have something that kind of gets that type of traction that it goes on. I mean, there've been tons of great releases and great cigars made by a lot of companies over the last 10 years, but the vast majority of them ultimately end up going by the wayside. Why is that? Well, was it really that great? Was it really that different? Or maybe it was that great. And it just isn't as great anymore. Mm. Because that's definitely very common in our business. Yeah. For, for great cigars to slide. And at the same time, too, even when you are one of those actually great classic, you know, well-established, eventually, even if they don't go down in quality, they eventually just end up losing their luster with time. Right. You know, look, it's, you know, it's, there was a point where, you know, Tiamo was the best selling cigar in America. I mean, Macanudo was the best selling cigar in America. There was this period where H. Upman was the best selling cigar in America, you know, and not, and not for a year, not for two years, but for quite a stretch there. So, so that's the other thing, you know, brands also have a bit of a shelf life, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, and, that, and that, that ends up happening. Um, but the thing is, when they get replaced, they get replaced by other brands that are consistently high quality, well-manufactured, 
no brand, there's never any brand that's the hot brand that hot, hot does not sustain you. Mm -hmm. What hot does is it gives you the opportunity to maybe make something sustainable. It gives you the exposure to a lot of customers that may otherwise not have heard of your products or heard of your cigars. It gets retailers to give you a shot in their store. But, but in the end, it is, it isn't enough. Oh yeah. It just isn't. And it never has been, and it never will be. Um, so I think that, you know, that, and that's, but you know, look, it's not exciting for you guys to do reviews of a Fuente Don Carlos number two that's been in the marketplace since 1993. It's not, it's not what your readers want to read about. You know what I mean? It's not what people are following. But honestly, I still think to this day, it's one of the absolute best Cameroon cigars ever uh, made. Yep. I mean, yep. I've smoked, I've smoked everything like you guys. Well, we don't smoke, you probably smoke more than I do of different stuff, but I smoke a wide variety. When people come out with new Cameroons, I go out of my way to try them, but I always kind of benchmark them against the Don Carlos blend. I benchmark them against the Hemingways, you know, the, the signature Hemingway series. For me personally, more the Don Carlos because the Don Carlos has a little bit more zip in its step and that's a little bit more of my flavor profile. But for me, I always benchmark them against that and I say to myself, huh, is it worthy of being side by side with the Don Carlos? Right. I, I haven't smoked any Cameroons. Now, have I smoked some Cameroons that I thought were really great? But I haven't smoked any of those Cameroon brands that have been as consistently great yeah. like that Don Carlos. Yeah. You know, it was great the year it was released. I really enjoyed it. But then I tried one nine months later. It was kind of like, oh, it's okay. It's decent. Yeah. You know, not bad. And, and, and therein lies the trouble that you have is it isn't enough for the cigar to be great in the moment. It has to be consistently great all the time. Mm-hmm. And it isn't enough, and you're not going to live on it being new because there's always something newer. Yeah. And there will always be something that's talked about more. And so that's one of the reasons why, one of the things that I think a big mistake that a lot of companies do is I think they waste the good faith equity that they have with their consumers. by releasing so many things that aren't on par with the thing that made them know. Absolutely. Totally totally agree. And because the thing that you have to understand is, yes, when you release something new, it's an easy sale. Mm -hmm. Company like ours, we release something new. We're going to sell 4,000 boxes without even thinking about it. Yeah. Okay. Just it's easy money, right? Maybe more now, actually. But the problem is every time you do it, it's also a risk because it's an opportunity where you're going to disappoint those people. Right. So I think, I think you have to be much more judicious about the releases. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes I think companies just kind of live on the new release idea without really thinking about how, yeah, the new gets you bigger numbers now, but in the end, it actually hurts you in the long run. Sure. But at the same time, your consumers that love your products and love your brands, they want the new because they want to. They still want to try more stuff. So you're caught in this weird balancing act of how do I give them what they want, but I don't sell. You know what I mean? I don't sell something that isn't. I don't want to say subpar because I don't think anyone puts a cigar in the market thinking it's subpar. Right. Look, there's there's definitely a difference, and it's all in the eye of the holder. Yeah. I don't think either of you guys were big fans of Sin Compromiso, right? Not really. It wasn't. Okay. It wasn't my. It didn't hit me. It's not saying it's a bad cigar. All right. So there you go. You weren't big fans of Sin Compromiso. Right. You know, I know for me, I love the blend. I love what it does, and I think it's for a particular consumer. Mm-hmm. I think the guy that smokes a Padron 1964, I think the Sin Compromiso was a really nice fit for that guy. I, I, I agree with that, yeah. 
Okay. So that's what I think. But in the end, it doesn't actually matter what you think or what I think. In the end, the consumer is going to end up deciding whether it is or it isn't, right? Look, I'm, I'm, look, I'm speaking so glowingly about Fuente. I've never been a fan of Opus X. Never suited my palate. I've smoked almost all of them over the years. Have I had some amazing ones? I absolutely have had some amazing ones. But for me, for whatever reason, that taste profile just never was right for me. Mm-hmm. But I'll be the first to say it's an exceptional cigar. Sure. I think they put a tremendous amount of attention to detail in it. I think they really sort and select great tobaccos for it. It's a question of, you know, does it suit me? Doesn't suit me. But it's some cigar that I would always recommend a consumer, which should they, yeah, you should definitely try this brand. Right. You know, it's, it's an iconic brand. It's an interesting smoke. Um, and I think sometimes... I think sometimes people mistake, they take advantage of their current success and they put products out that probably shouldn't be put out. Uh, You know what uh, I mean? Yeah. And I think it hurts them more in the long run, even though in the short term, it gets them a lot of initial quick sales. Mm -hmm. But you know what? that's easy to say i'm not the guy that has to pay their bills and pay their employees and you know all of those things so i mean they've they've got they've got commercial concerns too that they have to worry about just the same way as i'm saying in my head "Hmm, totus las dias my slowest performer yeah it's growing but would i have if a retailer can only carry three brands on their shelf from my company do I want them to choose Todos Las Dias to be one of the three brands? You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I really don't. You know, I really think that they're much smarter to pick, to pick these three or four brands before they pick that brand. Sure. Yeah, At the same fair. time, I have some retailers that Todos Las Dias is their number one selling brand of my products in their store. Mm-hmm. Their clerks like it. Their customers like it. But you have, you have to sometimes make some decisions like that because eventually what ends up happening when you make too much, you're not going to make winners that are going to make everybody happy, Yep. even if they're good. And every time you hit one of those, it starts hurting you a little here and a little there. And eventually you get to a point where the customer is kind of like, yeah, I've had so many of those Saka cigars and, you know, yeah, that first one was great, but the rest, eh, you know, I don't need to try his next one. Yeah. Even if the next one's the best one I've ever made for that guy, he may absolutely love it, but he won't even try it. So we all kind of get a little burnt out. So it's this weird balancing act of got to have new and fresh, yeah. but you also don't want to have too much either. Yeah. And you got to be really careful about the new and fresh. And the other thing too is I think a lot of people when it comes to those limited store releases, they take the path of the least resistance because there's no money in those limited store exclusives. Yeah. I mean, what? Red meat lovers. What? They bought a thousand bundles last year, right? It's 10,000 cigars. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're not going to, yeah, sure. If I was a much smaller company, I'd be ecstatic to have an easy sale of 10,000 cigars. Right. But, but in the long run, the way I look at those things is I always say to myself that my most loyal customers, the people that really follow my products and my brands, they're going to go out of their way to buy this limited, whatever limited production thing. They're like the last customer you want to disappoint. (laughs) <laughs> right they're the customer that's buying from a retailer that they don't normally do business with they're typically paying a premium because mm-hmm. it's some sort of limited production item and and what am i going to do i'm going to take a an el americano and cut a half an inch off it and put a different band on it and say it's something else right you know what i mean it, it's like it's very there's nothing wrong with an el americano you love the Aramon yeah. Kono, but it's also very, it's really taking advantage of your best customers, what you're doing there. Yeah. You know what I mean? 
Yeah. Or, oh, well, so-and-so, they want to have 50 bundles of whatever, 100 bundles of whatever. I'm just going to slap something together. He's going to sell them anyways. Mm -hmm. It's true. He's going to sell them anyways. Look, everybody that bought a U-boat bought that blind. Everyone yep. that bought a frog juice yep. bought that blind. Everyone that's bought any of these things, famous, 80th, red meat lovers, they've all bought it blind on faith. But sometimes you need to do that too. And I think that's a good thing that you're able to do that. So you have somebody that's willing to spend real money, totally blind, but yet you're going to take advantage of that guy by just, oh, well, it's only a hundred, whatever. It's only this slap something together, throw it in a whatever. You know what I mean? It's look, and it's, that's always been like my reluctance with Don Derma. Mm -hmm. Look, my opinion of Don Derma is it's okay. It's decent. It's a good cigar. I think it's an amazing cigar on the retro hail. Right. But right. I don't think if you retro hail it, I personally, I don't think it's worth the money. I've been very blatant about that. I, I say it all the time, probably much to the misery of my good friend, Ronnie at Secreto. <laughs> okay. But that's what I really think about the cigar. Okay. So for me, it's really important to convey the message that this cigar has to be retro hailed or you're really probably wasting your money. And it doesn't mean that someone won't smoke a Don Dharma who doesn't retrohale that won't love it. It's a good cigar, but it isn't that extra special thing. No. It's really extra special if you retrohale it, in my opinion. Now look, someone else can get it, retrohale it, and not think that at all. But, but I go into it on a basis of trying to deliver something to those consumers. And the other thing too, is it also kind of makes it a little difficult because I really kind of went out of my normal direction on frog juice. Frog juice is a very unsaka like blend if you smoke it. It's got some characteristics to it that if I, I don't think if that cigar, look, there's certain cigars you smoke and you can kind of go, oh, this tastes like a little Florida Minicana. This tastes like a Fuente. This tastes like a Pepin. There's definitely a common thread in my cigars all the way from top to bottom. It's kind of a bit of a signature style. For me, frog juice is a little bit of a bit of a, a leap of it. I don't think in a blind taste test, if you gave that cigar to someone, that they would have guessed that it was a cigar that I blended. Mm -hmm. But I also wanted to do something a little different, something a little funky, a little different presentation, not presentation in the way of how it looks, but presentation in how it smokes. Mm -hmm for those 250 people that went out of their way to buy a frog juice. Yeah. Um, so I'm always really, really cognizant. I put a lot of effort into those limited productions way more than what their <laughs> dollar value is. But I also look at everyone as an opportunity to fail, not as an opportunity to sell an extra 250 or 500 or thousand of whatever. I, th I always think about what damage am I going to do if this thing turns out to be just a total turd? Yeah. You know, look, everyone, every brand you release, every blend you release, there are going to be people that don't like it, period. You have to accept that. Mm -hmm. But also, we all kind of, we all had a certain response to, you guys want to say some brands so I don't get caught doing it? Sure. You yeah. talk about brands that had like set the world on fire and then kind of oh, faded to nothing. We all had high expectations for, uh, yeah. we all couldn't wait to try. We expected them to be really great. And then they hit the marketplace and we we're like, really, this is what we got. Yeah. I mean, I, I can easily name some. I can name some too. I just don't want to because it's just not the right thing for me to do. You're the media guys. Yeah. Yeah. I have no problem naming you can, brands. You, can, you, yeah. can, you, you review cigars for a living. I don't. <laughs> I mean, I would, for one, I would say, I would say Baca was a real big, like so much fanfare to it. And then it just, to me, it just didn't deliver. And I don't know. I don't think anybody really, well, I guess there were some people that were really high on it, but I think in the bulk of it, there wasn't, it didn't get as much of a push as I thought, you know, based on what it, how, what it was built up to be. Okay. I, I can see that. I, mean, I don't know what the sales are on it, but I mean, social media wise, it doesn't look like it. It seemed like it was a lot more social media hot before yeah, yeah. than after. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's unfair. Um, 
I mean, look about uh, what was the Drew Estate project? Uh, All Out Kings. I was thinking of those ultras. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was, going another way, one. I was going way back. Okay. You know what I mean? Oh, uh, um, I'll give you one. Um, and this is like 2011. Set oh, 2012. It was 2012. Set the world on fire. Everyone thought that this company and by this person was gonna be the next big thing, and the company's you know the person's not even in the working his company anymore. It, it's uh, Ortega Serie D. I mean it 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 lit, it was on every list that year. It was the rage, and the brand's gone today. I mean, and the company it because the cigar was disappointing. Because I remember the Ortega Series D ice smoke being pretty good, but it, it, yeah. in the end, it wasn't enough to sustain Ortega. No, I agree with that, but it's yeah. not the same as the. And I don't think my friends at Padron would be offended by this. I think they, I think we all pretty much agree. Yes. The Maso, yeah, you know, yeah, that would be another one that was. We all had, we all were very excited to try that. Mm -hmm. We all had very high expectations for that yeah. cigar. We all wanted it to be. We all wanted it to be amazing, right? Yeah. I mean, we, we all did. Yep. And and look, and, and, look, and that's why they reblended it, and it's been relaunched and released. And I mean, the current iteration of the is a significantly better cigar than the one that came out that first year, in my opinion. Right. Uh, you know. So, I mean, so you know that, that there's always a risk in anything new. So you have you have to be really really careful, and it's and look the big companies have the luxury of being more careful because they have a lot to live on. Us little guys that are just fighting for the crumbs, little sale matters. You're kind of forced onto this treadmill. This uh, what is the thing? The wheel hamster wheel. The hamster. Yeah. You know yeah. What I mean. The churn and burn and do all of these things is you're you're just trying to scrap and find a way to survive is what you're trying to do, and you're also you're you're hoping to you're hoping to get lucky. You're hoping that one of these ones might possibly catch, but the problem is every one that you make that doesn't catch ends up making the next one less likely to catch, and yeah. the one after that even less likely to catch. And it becomes the diminishing return until eventually you have a company that was like really hot and really going someplace kind of just peter out to nothing because they basically have burned through their customers where they kind of like, yeah, you know, I really loved what that was X, Y, Z ago, but man, these last three or four, I'm, you know, you know what? I'm going to try something else with my dollars. And it's, look, it's tough. It's hard. It, it's really, really difficult. And I, and I understand, but it's something that I don't think most small brand owners really think about. I don't think they strategically think about what's the purpose, who's the customer, why it exists, how does it fit in with my company, how does it apply to my consumer base. Look, you want to have a BACA conversation? Part of the issue might be with BACA is that, look, Roma Craft makes really heavy, strong, robust style, grand style cigars, and BACA isn't that. Mm -hmm. It's a Cameroon blend. So your built-in customer base, they have a certain kind of expectation. So what you have to do, and I'm not saying that they didn't, I don't know because I don't follow it, but it's kind of like me with brulee. I have to be really upfront about it. I have to tell people this is what it is. If you really love Tricky Traka and you really love Maca Tamales, you know what? Sober Mesa brulee may not be for you. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's a mild to medium cigar. It's Connecticut shade. It's got a sweet nature to it. Uh, there's nothing peppery about a brulee. There's nothing robust about a brulee. You know what I mean? It's uh, it's kind of one of these things. That, and I think you have to. I think you have to. You have to communicate that to your customers, 
So they kind of go into things knowing what to expect. Mm-hmm. You know, it's you know, it's part, it's part, it's it kind of falls on you to tell the story. And the story just can't be it's amazing tobacco and it's the greatest thing and yada yada yada. Because that's we all peddle that same bullshit story, right? It's yeah. more about really saying to a consumer that, hey, you know, sin compromiso. I recommend you smoke the number five. If you don't like the number five, try one of the smaller formats. They're not as creamy as the larger formats. But if you try an intrepido, you try a number five, it doesn't float your boat. It's just not a good blend for you. It's not going to float your boat. You know, is isn't going to happen. Now, I have another sin compromiso that is a stronger sin compromiso, a more robust sin compromiso. You know what? It may turn out that both of you feel that expression of it's a better expression. You may not. But the point is, when I release it, which is going to be in 2021, you will try it and you'll give it a fair try. Yeah. I don't feel as though I try very hard to tell everybody what everything is and not to set them up to be disappointed. Will, will somebody be disappointed? Absolutely. But in the end, I, I try really hard to manage them. It's the same. Look, you saw my thing on unicorn today, you know, yeah, the unicorns are out, but you know, buy six over Mesa, buy seven MK Ritas, buy 12 Umbagogs. It's a, it's a better way to spend a hundred dollars. It just honestly is. I think unicorns are amazing cigars, but a hundred dollars. No, I know that I'm not an idiot. I mean, so, and you know, and I think a lot of companies, you know, they, you know, they make a hundred dollar cigar and what they'll do is they'll just talk about how it's the most amazing cigar ever made and this and that, boom, boom, boom. And you set up these really unrealistic, unrealistic expectations that are impossible to achieve. So I think sometimes, you know, and, and I don't think the fact that it's just new is a reason for it to exist. There has to be, look, you, we're taking weeds and we're rolling them in a tube. It's all brown and round. It's very hard to make something that in some way hasn't been made before. So really it's more about doing something with your style, your technique, and also something that you don't currently have, you know, something different. I mean, would it be easy to just make, Naka tamales in different sizes and just release those as Muester de Saka. As far as I'm concerned, Naka tamale is the best of the Muesters I've made. I love that blend. Okay. Blend tastes great in a lot of other sizes. But I like the fact that I have Exclusivo. It's made out of tobaccos that are all over five years old. It's my least favorite of the Muesters, the Exclusivo. Personally, it's medium minus. It's kind of subtle. It's got these little notes and boom, boom, boom. It's kind of a little bit like a sober Mesa, regular original sober Mesa light. Mm. would be kind of more the comparison of where I would put it. Of the blends, it's my least favorite. I always tell people that, but I also tell them what it is. Right. It's made of tobacco. So they're all aged a minimum of five years. It's a milder expression. It's got that more vintage kind of nuance, mm-hmm. kind of textural kind of thing. There's a customer that loves that. Okay. There's a guy that that's the perfect cigar for that guy. I think uh, we were talking about Stace earlier with the fishing. I think if you ask Stace, I think he would tell you Exclusivo, in his opinion, is the best Moester I've made. Yeah. That was the first one. Right. For me, Naka Tamale is the best one that I ever made. I like that one the best of all the ones. I like, I like smoking Naka Tamale more than I like smoking the unicorn personally. Okay. Yeah. Way more time goes into a unicorn. Way more expense goes into a unicorn. Everything about a unicorn from that perspective is superior. But if we're saying, hey, which of these ones would you personally want to smoke? I personally would rather smoke a Naka Tamale. Yeah. You know, that's my, that's what I personally would want to smoke. So I think it's really important to understand what the product is, who you made it for, what it tastes like, 
And where does it fit in your scope? Why are you making it? Are you just making it so you have something that's easy to sell in the next year? That, that's a recipe for disaster in the long yeah. run. And I don't think enough people in our business really take the time to think about it. I think they spend a lot of time thinking about the branding. I think they spend a lot of time thinking about the marketing. But sometimes I feel that sometimes the cigar is a little bit of an afterthought. I see that for sure. That's not true across the board. Look, this is not this is not everybody, everyone. It's not like I'm the only one that thinks right. this way. But at the same time, there are a lot of people that they, they have a much different perspective on things. And uh, and it's uh, and look, and some of it, some of it is you get pulled one way. Look, had I given you guys Sin Compromiso and you told me I wasn't gonna like it, then I'd be like, well, maybe I should change it. Maybe <laughs> I should fix it. Maybe I should do this. Maybe I should that. But you guys see online how many people post in compromisos one of the oh, best yeah. cigars they've ever smoked. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, we see it all the time. They're... You know, you know. So the other thing too is just you know being confident about what you're doing, and you know not worrying about pleasing everybody, but at the same time also being honest with customers and. Look, if you like strong, spicy style cigars, Sin Compromiso is not a good brand. The current iteration of Sin Compromiso, it's it's a medium. I would put it medium strength wise is where I would put Sin. Yep. Right. But I love the creaminess. I love the texture of it. I love the softness of it. I, there's a lot of things about that cigar I find incredibly appealing. But I can also understand why somebody goes, wow, $17 for that. It didn't float my boat. There's a lot of other cigars I'd rather smoke for $17, you know, and I perfectly understand that. And that's why I don't, uh, I don't, uh, it's very rare that I get offended by someone not liking something. Yeah. I'm always, I'm always concerned the draw is right. I'm always concerned the burn is right. I'm always concerned, you know, those mechanics are mechanics. Um, but the whole flavor thing, the strength thing, the profile thing, that's really personal. And I, and, I, and I understand that. But I also feel like it's my responsibility to not tell someone it's just good. It's my responsibility to try to explain to them what it is, what it tastes like. And you see that every time I release anything, I'm very uh, vociferous with my explanations. Okay. Now, you guys may not agree with it. No, you are. You are. That's fair. But I think, but I think I pretty much kind of, I'm pretty good at describing the products mm -hmm. in the way that I think most consumers will perceive them when they smoke them. Yeah. You know? And look, part of that too is, yeah. Also, look, you're kind of setting a stage too. If I tell you this place in Chicago has the best pizza ever, wow, their cheese is amazing. You kind of go in there thinking, oh, wow, this cheese really is amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not a moron. I understand that. But I, I, th I think it's really, I think in some way, I have to wonder that when it comes to a product, if the manufacturer had spent more time explaining it to the customers before they bought it, if it would change the way we perceive it. You know what I mean? If you go into it with a different kind of mindset, you know, I, I think that because one of the problems that you have in our business is you've, you've always got to try to overcome that whole expectations. You know, consumers call it hype. But I mean, a lot of times it's not actually the manufacturer generating the hype. Right. Some products there are, but a lot of times it's the consumer, the fan base they're the ones that generate a lot of the hype. Sure. I mean, that we see it. That. And sometimes you gotta, you gotta pump the brakes on it a little bit. And look, I, I, I have this, there have been more than a few consumers that I've had to say to them, you know, just, I love you. I appreciate you love my brands, but you're not helping it <laughs> by being the way you're being. Yeah. You know what I mean? <clears throat> you know, it's just, it, it doesn't, I mean, 
it, it, you, you shouldn't be dying on the hill, you know, because yeah. you really love something. This other consumer doesn't like something. Right. Agreed. There's somebody, I'm going to tell you right now, there's somebody out there that you said Baca, Baca is their favorite brand. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I like Baca. And I like Baca. I like Baca. So, yeah. I mean, and I, I think that brand, you know, he's still got more sizes that are going to hit the market with that. So we'll see. How, you know, how look, I look, 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 and honestly, the question is, we'll know the answer. Will Baca be on the shelf seven, eight, ten years from now? Right. Exactly. That, that will that will ultimately answer the question. Yeah. Yep. You know. Now, but uh, so I mean, and and that's the way it is. But I I think that, uh, but I, I it's it's tough, man. It's it's it, it's tough because. Everybody wants something, and you're never going to satisfy everybody. Sure, yeah, that's true. And I always say to people, Steve, when I when I look at a portfolio and I start, you know, reviewing, some cigar is going to be at the top, and some cigar is going to be at the bottom. They all can't be number one. They sure. they all can't be. I mean, so, and and what what I do is I say it's subjective. You know, we are subjective. We, you know, we try to be fair, but I think that we people want our opinion. And if we don't do that, we're not being real. So, um, look, and there's certain consumer like Facebook groups. I look at the cigars some of them are smoking or saying really great cigars. Like, Dude, <laughs> that's like a mediocre shit box cigar. Yeah. You know, and you want to reply to that guy and say, "Dude," and not say, "Oh, you should smoke a sober mace or you should smoke a miquerita." You just want to say, "Hey, here's like eight things I think you really." <laughs> yeah, to yeah, we we get a lot. <laughs> we get a lot of that. And. And the other thing too is I also think you have to kind of, you know, judge it within a price point too. I mean, mm -hmm. look, if a guy's buying $3 cigars, you really got to put it against all the other $3 cigars in the market. Yeah. You know, you can't, you can't, you can't, I just don't think that you can compare a charter Oak to an Elway Wednesday right. or a tabernacle. Yep. I think that that's not a one-on-one -on -one kind of comparison. No, I think you, compare charter oak with other five to six dollar cigars yeah. how does it fare in the world of five to six now when you're smoking a tabernacle you're now hey now i'm comparing it to other 13 to 15 dollar cigars yeah. yep okay where is it in this in this thing you know so you know the thing is you know it's very you know because you know i see some things but there are some things the things that get me is when i see Something that I know is just really not all that great. And the guy spent 12 bucks on it. And I know that if he was probably exposed to these other six or seven brands, he probably would be happier. But that isn't my job to do that. Okay. That's part of your job. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's part of what you provide as a service. It's what tobacconists, retailers are supposed to be providing their customers as a service. It's ultimately what ends up happening on the internet over time. You know, eventually they read enough, they see enough, they get enough comments that look, you you become more exposed and you actually go, huh, wow, there are really a lot of better cigars that I never even knew existed. You know, my 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 horizons have been expanded, you know. And uh, but I mean it's uh, but it's it's I think this business is, it's a lot more complex than just really marketing and branding. Well, it's really a lot more complex than just making really great cigars. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of elements to this, you know, the distribution, the pricing structure, your customer relations on the back end, the things that customers never see, how the manufacturer interacts with the retailer. I mean, it sounds as things that you guys don't even think about, but just, how the invoicing and the packing lists work and the shipping and all these things, they make a real difference to our customers, not to our consumer customers, but, your but to our retailer customers. It really does. You know, and look, there are notoriously some companies in this industry that are just a pain in the ass to do business with. They make it hard. Okay. And there's others that make it super smooth and super easy and you know so and look those are the things that the consumer isn't going to see but it does play into what price the retailer decides to put on their shelf 
you know yeah i could buy this yeah it's a better cigar but man every time i do anything with that company they're you know they always screw up the invoice they always screw up the, you know i was supposed to get four of these but i got three of that and one of this and i didn't even want that you know what i mean all the time and these are things that affect how this works do you get that shelf space do you grow the brand look I'll tell you something that's a fault with our company. We're really bad at customer outreach. We're terrible at communicating on a regular basis with our retailers. And part of that is we're just so swamped. We're so behind. We're just, you know, fulfilling orders as they come. And it really makes it hard for us to just touch base with everybody as frequently as I would like for us to touch base with. But that's also a little bit of a, there's a certain amount of those touches that are great. And then you also hit a level where, man, those people keep calling me. They call me every week. Want to know when I'm going to place an order. They call me every two weeks. I just told them their cigar. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's this kind of like really kind of little bit of a fine line. You want to do so much, but you don't want to do too much. You know, because look, it's not Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust calling that retailer. It's every single company in the industry and not just the ones that they have on their shelves, but all the ones that want to be on their shelves. Mm -hmm. uh, the retailer gets deluged <laughs> with pitches. They get deluged. They get, they get tired of it. They don't even want to be like, Oh, no, I don't even want, you know, how many retailers in this country? Like, I don't ever want to see the salesman. I don't ever want to see the rap. <laughs> oh, I know. A couple. They hate it. I know. I don't want in particular. Yeah. They, yeah. They, I mean, yeah. so, where there's other retailers that if you don't do that, they won't buy from you. No, it's true. So you got some that don't want to ever hear from you. And you got others that they absolutely want to hear from you. And if you don't call them, they actually take offense that you didn't call them. It's, 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 it's not as easy as folks think. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's tough, man. It's, it's tough. So it's, it's, uh, there's a lot that goes into somebody ultimately being successful, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a lot more than just whether the cigars are good or not good. Yeah. If, if that was the criteria, this, this would be a much different game than it really is. Mm -hmm. You know, for you, the consumer, yeah, it's, you know, it's different, but is it? Cause if you, even if it's really good, if you can't get space on someone's shelves, and look, there's a lot of retailers. They only buy stuff because it's on deal. Yeah. Look, if they can get 10, 15, 20 points, if they can do a buy three, get one, buy four, get one on a regular basis. I mean, look, there are brands out there that that's their entire launch model. Yeah. That they basically give the retailer a free box for every three he buys. Mm -hmm. Every four boxes he buys, he gets a free box you know how much more margin they make on that brand yep. so why am i going to carry a product that they're not giving me any deals on yeah you know if i gotta choose to put something on my shelf and this guy's basically giving me an all the time 20 25 off on everything well i'm gonna buy from the place that gives me 25 percent off look at how much more money i make selling their cigar versus that cigar yeah you have retailers that they want to carry cigars that are a certain price point. They want cigars that are under $10 for them. Their sweet spot is seven to nine in their store. That's their customer sweet spot. We have other retailers around the country. They don't even want to talk about something new if it isn't $15. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot more confusing business than I think people really understand. Sure. Very good. Yeah. It's, so it's a lot more complex. Mm -hmm. Very good. I can't believe anyone's still watching this. We, we, we have, we have, it, 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 I, the, we've had a pretty good audience tonight, actually. It's been uh, yeah. good numbers. So, yeah. So, Steve, um, yeah, um, we're getting to the end here because it is late for all of us on the East. Um, but first of all, I want to thank you very, very much for, uh, for being on the show. Thank you for the support. Uh, the friendship we, we really appreciate it um and you know we'll, i know we'll see sometime we'll see you down the road 
Yeah, it's going to eventually happen, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> it has right. to happen some right. point. Right. Good God, I mean, this can't go on forever. No, it can't. It can't. I mean, it's, uh, yep. I mean, it's gonna. It's, we'll see. We'll see how. We'll see how we make it through this winter. We'll see how this. Uh, all of this goes, but I mean, I don't know, man. I'm. I am going stir crazy though. Yeah, yeah me too. Bet. Me too. I'm. I'm ready, man. I, I actually. <laughs> I actually even missed the events. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> I miss events. Wow. That's sad. Yep. <laughs> Isn't it like everything? You, you get burned out at everything. It doesn't yeah. even matter yep. how great it is. Yep. Yeah. Really? Fucking lobster again? <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, I can't stand this. <laughs> uh. <laughs> but yeah, it's going to. Yeah, I, I don't. I just don't. I don't know. I mean, so before we leave, so tell me three cigars I should smoke that came out this year. Not mine, obviously, but if you had to tell me, hey Steve, these are three I think you should go out of your way to try. Well, Aladino well, Cameroon Lonsdale. That's one. Yeah, I like I, the Aldinos a lot. I think it's a nice draft. Yeah, so it's a different. Aldino, Cameroon, yep. Uh, the La Florida Minicana, small batch number seven. Okay. Which one again? Small batch number seven. Small batch number seven. Got it. I think it really flew under the radar this year. Okay. Yep. That's two. You got a third one between you? Uh, Avo Classic Maduro that was re-released this year. Really? Yes. That would definitely not be one that I would have picked up on yeah. my own volition. Definitely yeah. try it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, my other one, uh, the, the Perdomo, um, the Perdomo, um, what's last year's technically, um, the ESV Maduro, that's technically okay. last year. That was a good cigar. Yeah. Yeah. I like that one. All right. Um, before we go, yeah. uh, I just want to announce next week's show. Um, next week, uh, primetime episode 164, uh, Carlito Fuente is our guest. Ooh, nice guest. Yeah. You get so, a lot of viewers for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. So that will be next week. And I'm actually doing Carlito's Meet the Professor on Sunday, which just kind of timed out like that. That wasn't, like, planned like that originally. Um, okay. Yep. So stay tuned for that for sure. Um, and then Aaron and I are doing Lazona Palooza Takeover shows next week. So yep. you got yours Monday. I got mine Tuesday. So we'll have the whole Lazona crew on with those shows. Or different members exactly. of the crew. Different members of the crew. Yeah. yeah. Doing that virtually this year. Is that what they're doing? Yeah. 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 So Aaron's doing Monday night, and we're doing Tuesday night with Bear. Okay. And they're doing their event that Saturday, following Saturday, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're doing. I think they're doing it. Th I think they're actually starting it the night we have Carlito on. A physical event though, or no? No. No. In fact, is it I, physical? No, there's. Yeah. They're, they're, it's just going to be, I think, the Espinosa crew in the warehouse. I don't think even the other brands are coming in this year, from what I heard. It'll be interesting yep. to see. Yep. So it'll be interesting Look, as well. We all know it's we all we all it's a substitute, right? Yeah. We we all know it's a substitute. We're all making do with what we got. I mm -hmm. think I think the thing that I wonder is are we just tired of even the substitute at this point? <laughs> yeah, I, I I you know, here, here's the thing. I haven't been and it's not that it's bad quality or anything. We just have been doing this for so long, Aaron and I and Bear. And we've been doing we do this every week. Um, right. So, you know, it's it's challenged us to try to have conversations with guests that aren't on these Zoom hangout or chats. And, and you know, so, I mean, I think the Fuente people, they've they've kind of found their it took them a while to find a niche with their show. I, I'm going to be I'll be the first one to say it, but I think they have found a niche lately. Like a Sunday afternoon show seems to work for them. They seem to have a rhythm with their guests, you know. So, you know, it's what interesting. What are we talking about? I lost track here. Oh, Which that was show? the Fuente show to meet the professor. Oh, yeah. Well, look, it takes time to build. It, yeah. It, yeah, I think they realized they, they had some technical challenges early on, and but they've gotten a rhythm going with it now. Um, 
So, you know, I think, I think, like I said, but, but we do this every week and it's like, uh, Aaron and I haven't missed a week since the pandemic started. I think we've done this every right. Thursday. We're going to Thanksgiving. We're taking the week off. So, um, yeah. And we have a, some Christmas time off, but yeah. Um, but yeah, we've done this every week and, uh, you know, we, our audience is tuned in, which is great. I mean, I appreciate the audience support. I mean, there's people up at 142 on the East Coast still tuned in. Yeah. And so, oh. It's because we're dying. Look, yeah. I'm like, I'm having another cigar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm going to... I'm going to have another cigar. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I, but, uh, I have some work to do, actually, so... I'm yeah, gonna, no problem. Yeah. We're going to close... Like- Cool. We're going to close it out. Thanks to everybody. Thank you, Steve. That's going to wrap up primetime episode 163 into the annals of history for Thursday, November 5th. Now Friday, November 6th on the East and 10th Central Time Zone. We'll see everybody next week. Take care, everybody. Have a great week. See you guys.